Visualizing, battling out and making it real. Dedication, on a level only you can feel. Motivation, it gets stronger every year. Realization, action cures fear. The Surfcast, yeah. Team Anti Over It. Zero Yell. Major inspiration. Is this enough? 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 Get psyched. Let's do this. Is this enough? 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 Is this Stoke level? Oh. The Surfcast. Dave Nelly Nelson is one of the most prolific surf skate shooters of our time. His innovative approach combines the world's best surfers with angles and camera techniques that continually push the level of his photography and as a result, surf photography itself. The road to the top is never an easy one and Nelly's journey is at once fascinating, surprising, and inspiring. This conversation took place in Playa Colorado, Nicaragua on a bro trip to celebrate Meekster's 60th birthday. Here we Straight are. into it, okay. Nelly. And I want to start kind of at the very beginning of your journey. All my friends started surfing, I was still skating. I was the only one who was still skating Winchester and shit, so I'd take the bus there and go skate by myself. And the guys I looked up to were already really good at skating. So I was trying to get as good as them, whitey guys I'd see at the park, you know what I mean? That's it was good. like, well, obviously Meekster, Steve Caballero, Poon, um, there was a whole onslaught of guys, you know what I mean? Guys that I didn't even know their name that were ripping the keyhole. Other guys that were ripping the half pipe, it was like, when I started skating Winchester, I was a tiny Grom that could barely get down the half pipe. I couldn't even do the transitions yet, you know what I mean? And I'd go flying out the end and I'd do like a fake kick out air and you know, I had like a down vest on and fucking no pads and you know what I mean? Or pads, but they weren't really pads, you know? Anyway. Um, and like anything else, I was just straight addicted to skateboarding, you know what I mean? And it was like, I wanted to get good and I got good. I learned how to do rock and rolls in the peanut bowl like within weeks of being there, you know what I mean? And, and, and then um, all my friends started surfing. And so one day I went across the street to my friend Tony Michael's house and he's like, I'm getting a new board, you wanna buy my old one? It was like a seven, no, it was like a 610 Hout single fin. I'm like, how much? He's like, 40 bucks. I'm like, done. So I started mowing lawns and picking up rocks. My next door neighbor had this like, he'd always pay us a penny a rock if we picked up his rocks, you know what I mean? And so I, into buckets, you know, I, being who I was, I picked up, you know, a thousand rocks, you know what I mean? And went 10 bucks. So I was 10 bucks closer to the 40 bucks I needed for the new single fin, you know what I mean? Anyways, uh, so I started surfing. That changed my life for sure because I was all into Little League and, and that was my life. Like baseball was my life, you know what I mean? I knew every stat on every player and whatever. As soon as surfing came into the picture, that kind of started to... It, it's not like I quit, but it, it, it wasn't my focus anymore. Now I just wanted to surf. And my first session at Natural Bridges Beach Break, I stood up in the white water. It changed my life forever, you know what I mean? And then the second session was at 38th left and I got my first open faced wave where I actually rode the face of the wave and then it was like, from there it was just on, you know what I mean? It was like nothing else mattered. Started cutting school and going over there with my older friends who already had their driver's license and 
and then 82, 83 hit and I started surfing the river mouth and it was like I was it was like I don't know how but I knew that that was something special and it was most of the time too big for me but on those medium days you know I mean those lefts being out there and watching Richard Sh I mean uh, Rufo and, and Nacho and all the legendary goofy foots in Santa Cruz changed that changed me forever too you know I mean I used to also take the bus over there from Saratoga and I'd pull up there I'd go to the dream Inn. I had this little it was like a janitor's closet that I'd go to and I'd change into my suit and stash my clothes behind some Clorox and I'd walk down to the river mouth and go surf you know I mean, for hours come home in the dark my parents would be like where where have you been I'm like oh I went surfing after school you know what I mean they're like how and I'm like oh I took the bus you know what I mean Anyway, I had to work so hard for it, it became really valuable to me. I hitchhiked to Santa Cruz by myself. You know, it's not something that anyone else was doing. But I was fiending on surfing, you know, and I wanted to get good at that, just like I wanted to get good at skateboarding, you know what I mean? So explain to the people where you grew up, like, how far it is from the beach, like, so they have an idea of what you're talking about. Yeah, so without traffic, Saratoga is about a half hour from the beach. Mm -hmm right over the hill um, next to San Jose, between San Jose and Las Gatas. It's this little bitchin' town in the woods, in the redwoods. And, uh, you know, I didn't really fit there. I, I found out later, you know what I mean? It just wasn't like a town that, Santa Cruz was more like my fit and I knew that instantly, you know what I mean, when I went there. But, you know, I finished out my kind of finished out my high school there and then I was gone. I moved to Santa Cruz instantly the day that I graduated, 17 years old. I was like, boom, never looked back. I think it was 10 years before I went back to Saratoga from the day I left. So I'm kind of curious about how you, um, you kind of gave up on baseball and just from, from surfing have that big of an impact and a lot of people consider surfing a sport some consider it an art there's always that question you know what I mean yeah but here we have kind of a clear example of like you quit a sport because you're doing another activity like in those early days there was no like pro surfing so you obviously didn't see it as a sport so touch on how that can like replace something do you see it as a sport back then like I mean it was a sport it was considered a sport already you know I mean I was like I grew up on Michael Ho winning the pipe masters with a broken wrist you know I mean it was like that was on wide world of sports I was watching that and like I saw the buttons thing of him and Mark Liddell on whatever show that was on on TV and it was like oh that's my hero now I, lo I love his fro I love his switch stance style, his carving, everything about him. That's who, I, that's who was like, you know, I wanted to be that guy's best friend. He was my idol, you know what I mean? And uh, how, I never gave up on baseball, but it naturally replaced it because it became so important to me that became secondary or third after skateboarding. Once I found surfing, skating became a part of surfing. And there was nothing I loved better than going to a sick ditch and doing a rail grab carve or anything that emulated surfing, just like I'm sure yourself and, and Jay Adams and whoever else. It was like, okay, I, I want to go surf, but there's no waves or the waves suck. So I'm going to go surf the streets. You know what I mean? We had, my driveway was called Mahalo's. We named it Mahalo's and it was a surf spot and it was a bank. And we'd go, we'd sit on our boards in the garage, paddle in, stand up, and do huge wrapping bottom turns off my driveway, you know what I mean? And it was like, that was our surf spot for a while, you know what I mean? When we couldn't get to the beach, because a lot of times we wanted to go, but we couldn't get there. You know, we were begging our sisters to take us, and they were like, fine, we don't want you little groms along with us, you know what I mean? And, and so we got, you know, that, that created the drive that I needed where I wasn't, spoiled and jaded in that way I had I had to work really hard to get to the beach I had to work really hard to go surfing it wasn't easy for me you know what I mean 
and uh, I remember that, you know what I mean? I'll always remember that. Like that taught me, that partly molded my drive to succeed, you know what I mean? It was like, you had to get creative, you know? I remember like cutting one class before lunch so we could fly out of there at 10.50, race over the hill, surf natural bridges, race back as fast as we could and we'd pull into school and like five minutes late for our fifth period, you know what I mean? Like shit like that, like we were nuts. That's how fiending we were on surfing, you know what I mean? Anyway. That's fucking rad. So, tell us about your crew back then. The crew. So, you know, the crew wasn't really my crew. I was, I was kind of dorky, you know what I mean? And I, I was tiny. I was the smallest kid in my school. Second smallest. R like, literally. Like, skinny. I didn't fill out till later in high school. And so I was this tiny little kid. Whitey, OJ, Tony Michaels. They were all the popular kids, right? I wasn't in that crew. I had to work my way in. And so, uh, you know... That's why I grinded so hard to get good at skating. I was always by myself. I was a loner, you know what I mean? So I would skate miles and miles by myself every day after school because I wasn't invited to wherever they were going, you know what I mean? And um, slowly, I think in freshman year, they like accepted me into that crew. And, and then I built a ramp in my backyard and it, you know, it was every day after school. It was Nellie's ramp. Suicidal tendencies, dead Kennedys, like skate all night till dark. And, you know, the cops were always at my house. And <laughs> it was like na neighbor complaints. And, you know, all the crew, p anyone who had a driver's license was parked in front of my house. You know what I mean? So Whitey's Scout was there and OJ's Ranchero was there. And you had the, the guys who were really serious about skating and they didn't surf and then you had the surf skaters and then you had the surfers who'd just hang out on the roof and watch chicks, whatever. You know what I mean? It was all part of the scene at my house and I had the only ramp of anyone in, in that era of Saratoga High, you know? So it was quite a scene. Anyway, the scene you asked about the, my crew. Uh, Mark OJ was probably the best uh, most progressive surfer in my crew. You know, he did airs. He was really quick to his feet, really light on his feet. Super, super good surfer and progressive. Whitey was the style master. He was the Buttons or the Bertelman of our crew. You know what I mean? He was the first guy who could do inverts. Um, and he just had a perfect mesh of surfing and skating. And they complemented each other. And somehow he knew, and he had a huge fro, you know what I mean? It was like, the whole thing was like, we, we all idolized Whitey, you know what I mean? And made fun of him, because he was a full show off, you know what I mean? He'd wait for the neighbors to walk by, and then he'd time it perfectly so that he could do a big hand plant. And they'd be like, oh, you know what I mean? He, he was that guy. And it was awesome, but we all fucking made fun of that, you know what I mean? Anyway, there's a lot of people. Birdo, Steve Geisinger and our crew, he was really gnarly skater super into surfing too um just kept getting better and better and better at skating you know what i mean where he was doing nolly like all these different nose pick stuff on the, he did tricks different tricks than we did like we were all into the stylish rock and rolls and whatever and he was into these like new school tricks that just came out and learning those and like I was baffled, you know what I mean? How do you do a nose pick at the Egg Bowl in La, like in Los Gatos? Like, the, impossible. It's impossible. The thing's so vert, you know? Anyway. Um, Doug Smith was like one year younger than us. He was, uh, we kind of brought him into our crew. And he was the ollie man, you know? And he could ollie over anything, and he was gnarly. And, you know, we'd, we'd be skating down the street, and he'd see a iris setter running across and he would skate as fast as he could and he'd go pawn ollie over these huge dogs you know what i mean shit like that he was just nuts and also our whole crew was pretty pretty nuts as far as like anything goes so we were always in trouble you know at our school there was a tree there called the ganko tree and all the jocks hung out under it and we'd get out there early on the day that failing notices came out. 
because we'd all got our failing notices. There's these pink failing notices that you're failing these classes, and we'd plop them all up and down the branches. We'd poke them on the branches so that it was like a Christmas tree of failing notices, <laughs> right, where the jocks hung, hung out. It was classic. We did not get along with the jocks. The jocks were gnarly in our school. So it was fights, and they'd come by you in groups, and they'd slam you into your rot lockers. Anyone that was a surfer or a skateboarder, basically, you were the enemy. And it was just like that. You know, I mean, we had a few crossover people where it was like we were friends. A few jocks that we were friends with and a few skaters that the jocks were cool with. But like for the most part, it was full rivalry, gnarly. So we had to deal with a lot of that all four years. You know what I mean? They would t tape you up on the, duct tape you up on the pole and pull your pants down and walk away and just leave you there. You know what I mean? Gnarly shit that I, I know for a fact you guys dealt with in Santa Cruz as well. Um, yeah, that's my crew. And there's, a, there's so many. There was like 40 or 50 surfer skaters in my crew. But those are my tightest ones. The ones I hung with every day was yeah. those guys, you know? Yeah, for sure. Matt Walker was another one who's surf skater for life, you know what I mean? Yeah. Engie was like your guy's pots. Who? And Chris English. Ingi, Ingi didn't grow up with us. Okay. No, he was from Los Altos. Okay. So I met Ingi skating a ramp in Los Altos one day with Sean Quinn and Jeff Gentry. And uh, it was the first, I met all three of them on the exact same day. And uh, me and Whitey went and skated this ramp and those, those guys were there. And, uh, you know, we showed up. I don't know how we weren't shy or whatever back then. We just ran up to the platforms and started skating and they're like, fuck yeah. What's your name? You know what I mean? And we ended up broing down with them. And then two years later, I saw Sean Quinn at 26th Avenue and, and Ingi. And I was like, I remember you guys from the grant ramp. And they're like, yeah, what's up? And we just became best friends. You know what I mean? But like, that's how we met. I didn't know them growing up. You know, I knew Ingi's brother because I used to skate the cat house, which was this famous pool in Los Altos. And Ingi's brother was like a ripper, like gnarly, gnarly backyard pool rider, like the one of the best ones in the valley. And um, so I knew him, but I didn't know Chris. I didn't even know he had a brother, you know what I mean? And then I met Chris later on a different ramp in Los Altos, and that's how we became friends. That's unbelievable. So you, you moved to Santa Cruz. Yep. You kind of were, like found your true nature you know, like as a young man, you found like where you were comfortable or whatnot. And then you ended up like getting really good at surfing and skateboarding and going to San Diego. Yeah. What was that all about? Uh, so I did a trip down there and it was my first trip to San Diego ever. You know what I mean? And, uh, Met all these people, and st I think Whitey and OJ were living there at the what time. Just to all the people in Mission Beach, you know, and there was this huge crew, kind of similar to our crew in Santa Cruz, whatever, but they were all like tight and they all partied together and they, they lived in this place called the Surf Rider, and it was like every house, there was like 50 apartments, every one was like some of the boys or the girls, you know what I mean? And so every night there was a party and they had, you know, over here they listened to The Cure and this one they listened to Metallica. And it was like everybody just moved around and partied together and surfed. Really good waves. South Mission Jetty is like one of the best waves around, you know. And um, just, I was just enamored by the place. I was like, wow, we got La Jolla right there. Crazy waves. Being a goofy foot. I got to surf blacks that trip. There was dolphins jumping over my head. I was like, fell in love with that. And I went back home to Santa Cruz and I'm like, I'm moving, I'm out of here. I'm going to San Diego. Didn't really think it through, you know? Um, so I formulated this plan of I was gonna go to Mesa Junior College, you know what I mean? And I hit my parents up and they're like, I don't know about that, you know? They were like, we'll give it a shot. We'll give you like one semester to see how you do. So they paid for my rent for one semester, and I failed out of everything, obviously. And, uh, <laughs> and then that was the end, and then I had to figure it out myself. And so I was down there, and I, was, I, I moved in with Stan 
Roy Ball and Doug Smith and was just scratching every month. So, you know, I got a job at this weird breakfast nook called the Eggery or something and I, you know, served breakfast there and it was like that didn't last long. It was just my personality, you know what I mean? It was like if the waves came up, I was surfing. There was no, it wasn't even a doubt whether I was going to go to work or not, you know what I mean? So that didn't last long. So anyway, I scratched by for a while down there. I was partying hard and the whole scene was gnarly and I met a lot of cool people that are still friends with Justin Poston. Got all these guys that I'm still friends with to this day and we still talk to each other to this day. So important friendships were made. I did a lot of surfing and skating. You came down, we surfed, we skated Del Mar. We did all, you know, you brought Johnny Boy Gums over and we, you know, burned fatties at the table with fucking, like that was, that shit, it's legendary, you know what I mean? Anyway, that was a good era in life. That but was it was also, it was also a telltale era for what was to come in my life, you know what I mean? Where I was like, got to make a decision between partying and, and life. <laughs> Because it doesn't go hand in hand for a guy like me. But you were just like having fun, and it was part of the fun, and, and so partying was just normal to you, right? It was, it was, but it was, it was all, partying was totally normal, and that part of my partying was totally normal still. But it's hard to go to one story, you know what I mean? Because there were so many different facets of my life. But as far as partying goes, like we were up and down that boardwalk in Mission Beach to, so, to South Mission. We lived in North Mission. In between was, you know, it was just, we met these locals down there, Johnny Rotten and his brother Jorge, and they were the guys, you know I mean? They owned the South Mission Jetty. They ran the show. Pretty underbelly Mission Beach, San Diego guys, you know, they were affiliated with all kinds of different people. And, uh, so we ran with a semi-tough crew, too, in, in Mission Beach. Um, it, it was a lot of anything goes, you know what I mean? Like, you never knew what we were getting into. Yeah, that's for sure. A lot of drugs going down around there, you know what I mean? A lot of, like, I didn't do it, but there was a lot of meth, a lot of crime, ecstasy, lots of ecstasy lots of it was just it was like i said it's anything goes down there you know what i mean and so that was my first santa cruz it was like different you know like we had a coke dealer living downstairs from me at tropicana but that was about it there wasn't like this like criminal underground like gnarly shit going down you know like i moved to ocean beach for a couple months one time and like my downstairs neighbors got murdered <laughs> You know what I mean? They found him with a bullet hole in his head because he was a meth dealer. And that's what was my introduction to OB. It was like the day I moved in. There was like corners and cops everywhere. And like, you know, I didn't see that stuff in Santa Cruz. You know what I mean? So anyway, if you're looking for examples, it depends on which, which, uh, which part of my life you're talking about. Like we'd go skate in Del Mar Skate Ranch and we'd drive all the way to Del Mar in the middle of the night and go skate it. Me and Doug and Stan and we'd skate it with Adrian Demain and all these locals. Tony Hawk would show up sometimes and like all these gnarly GSD Del Mar locals and we'd have gnarly skate sessions. None of us wore pads, you know what I mean? Slammed on my head, got knocked out. Adrian Demain ripped me out of the pool. And I woke up and I was like staring up at him and he was like, fuck you, okay, dude, that was gnarly. And I still have a bump on my head to this day from that slam, you know what I mean? And we were just punk rock, you know? Doug would drive, he didn't give a fuck. He would drive 110 miles an hour down there. And it was just like, we walked in like we owned the place, you know what I mean? And here we are not even from there. But that's just like, Doug was so full of himself and we rode off that energy, you know what I mean? And then Stan was the most sarcastic fucking human ever. So it was like, I was just kind of like sidekicking almost off those guys because they were so f full of themselves, you know what I mean? And those are my roommates. So it was like, oh, these guys are just walking. Like we didn't even pay or nothing. We'd just walk in and start skating, you know? It was just like, I don't know, just different, different shit, you know what I mean?
Who were some of the characters that you guys used to hang out with back then? Oh, uh, down in Mission Beach. Yeah, and um, Del Mar and all those days. God, we had such a big crew. OJ was down there. John Feldman from Goldfinger, he lived down there. He was, you know, always in these big bands down in San Diego, so we'd always go see him and Mosh and whatever. And, and um, uh, Harry Jamoji was, like, this Brazilian dude that, like, latched on to me Doug and Stan and he was always at our house and he was just like the most classic character ever always rapping throwing down freestyles for 15 20 40 minutes at a time like go on and on and on we're just like whoa this guy's like crazy and he would always go skate with us too so he was always down for the missions we'd go pick him up down wherever he was and go bring him to the to the sessions at Del Mar huge laybacks and just the sickest style like one of a kind really definitely influenced by Hasoy you know all the laybacks and all that stuff that he did and he definitely idolized Hasoy you know I remember talking to him about that back in the day and now what's ironic is he's really good friends with Hasoy and uh, anyway he's another guy we had a huge crew there was all kinds of girls in our crew so you guys were going down to TJ. So yeah, we'd go down skate Tijuana Skate Park and go rage down there. We'd go see, you know, we saw the Bad Brains in Tijuana. We saw uh, a bunch of different bands down there. I'm trying to think of who else was like, oh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Revolution Avenue was the thing, you know, I got knocked out cold by some gnarly jock walking out of there. Just walking out of there and he said something to me and I said something sarcastic back and the next thing I knew I was laying on the ground just knocked out, you know. We got in a lot of trouble down there, you know. And I started surfing Big Rock and I didn't know what a his story I, I kinda knew actually, but but it was a it's a big localized spot, you know, with a lot of history with guys like Richard Kenvin and Joe Roper and uh, you know, Joel Tudor and um, Chris, Chris, what's his name from OB? O'Rourke? No, but him too. Anyway, they had a huge scene of all these legends, and I had respect for all those legends, but there's also a under those guys scene of all these underground heroes that, you know, what I mean, and I had. I had to learn the ropes out there all over again, just like I had to learn in Santa Cruz, you know? Chris Menzi. Luckily for me, I was a historian, so I knew a lot about a lot. And if I didn't know, I'd ask. You know, I became really good friends with David Eggers, and so I'd be like, Eggers, who's that guy? And he's like, oh, dude, that's the guy. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he'd tell me his whole history. He'd be like, that's Mika. He fucking rips and this and that. And so I learned really fast. And I was also the guy who would have no problem sitting and waiting for the channel waves while those guys were sitting really deep in the double up, you know what I mean? And, and anyway, that was another big part of my San Diego experience was surfing over there. I was there at the crack, you know, I'd go at the crack and I'd be like, ooh, it's six foot, I'm out there and be the first guy out. It was before the boogie board onslaught. And so, and it was also after Joe Roper's prime. So there was kind of an era right then where it was like, yes, it would get crowded. Nobody surfed it at the crack. There was just, it wasn't that era of like, you know, guys didn't show up then, you know, and then they'd You're come. You're so lucky to experience that. Yeah. Because that's a really special part of the coastline. I mean, you came from Santa Cruz, then you end up in San Diego, able to experience all that. And it's kind of, San Diego is a lot more like neutral than, well, not wind and sea, but most places, yeah. you know, you can at least surf. But then take us through how you ended up kind of going from there back to Santa Cruz and then ended up going to Reunion. Oh, yeah. So that was shortly thereafter. It was like, <clears throat> it just wasn't working for me in San Diego. It wasn't functional. It was awesome. I was good at partying. And I got a lot of surf and skate time in. But as far as, like, I wasn't wealthy. And so I didn't have a way to get by without. It was one or the other. You're either good at partying, and you got parents that are willing to support that, which mine weren't, or you're out of there, or you get or you get a job. You know what I mean? And 
I didn't have any skills as far as work goes. So I had to get out of there. And so I decided to move back to Santa Cruz. I got in a really gnarly car accident actually at the, at the end of my Mission Beach stay. I got T-boned by this guy. We were going, just driving down the road going like 45 and this guy just flew out of the side street. T-boned us right on my side of the car and just I went you know I was straight to the hospital and my neck was messed up my back was messed up and and uh, that was a perfect time to get out of there I was like okay I can't surf I can't skate I can't work and this guy's got no insurance so I'm not getting any money and so I'm gonna go back to Santa Cruz and recoup there and my parents helped me you know I mean as far as like I could go over there and eat food and <laughs> and eat their Advil and drink juice and <laughs> try to get better, you know what I mean? So it didn't take me long to recover. I was a healthy, young dude. And um, back at it in Santa Cruz I was, you know. So basically, I'm not sure. Like we were already hanging out, me and you, know, by a little yeah. way long before that. Yeah. So, so me and you would go Came shoot. Back and we moved in with Felix. Yeah. Right. Possibly. Near, near uh, like twenty, the lake behind. Twenty fourth. Yeah. No, that was before I left San Diego. Okay. Yeah. So I came back. I'm not sure where I moved into. Maybe with Eric Bolin on Thirty Sixth or something. You know what I mean? And it was just Pleasure Point was gnarly back then. You know, we had our scene. I'd hang out at Meeksters. We'd go to Booker's Beach. We'd go to 26th Avenue. And it was the same thing every day, pretty much. You know, we'd party. We'd go to the corner pocket. You know, anyway, there was this big scene. There was a lot of us. And he, we were bordering the line of derelism. You know what I mean? It was like we were, we were good at surfing. We were good at skating. But for what we were really good at was partying. And it was taking away... And being Daryl, so and we were, and it was taken away from what we were good at, totally. you know. And that was okay. become that was becoming what we were good at. So at one point, um, I just actually Maui came before reunion, so I moved to Maui. I got a girlfriend. We went over there together. We loved it. Stan Royball was living there with his girlfriend, which was your sister. Yes. And uh, with V, and and there and Stan didn't live in this house, but we ended up staying in this house. And they're like, actually, we got a room for rent if you guys want. It's the master bedroom. We went back to Santa Cruz. We're like, what are we doing? We went. We moved back over there. Or actually, I got a job while I was there at Hobie in the cannery. And we came back all our shit and moved over there. And so I got, and then she ended up getting a job, and so we just ended up living in this crip house for fairly cheap up Waikuli Road in Maui. And um, you know, my favorite thing about that was walking out, drinking coffee in the morning, and watching Whales Breach and Mala Wharf would be grinding off, and like that became my my thing. Like I was like super pumped on on uh, changing my life. To, to something more away from partying and more like into like nature and surfing again, hardcore. So I started disguise, discovered windmills, and uh, that became my spot. You know, as far as not my spot, but like that became where I went every day. And I ended up meeting all the crew out there, the Anderson, the fucking Fruit Bean, all the boys. And they kind of accepted me. They're like, "Fuck, this guy's kind of, this guy's kind of dope." You know what I mean? But it was definitely like, could have gone either way. Oh, this guy's a maggot, J O J, or this guy's cool. And and so we ended up being friends. And I'd see him down there. There was a big hangout zone at windmills down below where everyone would hang, and all the broken boards were all over the place. They made all these statues out of all the broken boards, and it was kind of like our own pipeline. And this is before it got packed, you know, the way before the Clay Marzo, you know, surfing. Anyway, so I ended up hanging in Maui for a long time. Did you hang out with like Kaleo and Justin and Toda and those guys? I did a little bit, but mainly that they were Paia and like I didn't have a car. So 
I met this guy named Dennis, and he was from Reunion Island. No, he was from Africa, from Senegal. And he walked into my store this one day. I'm like, holy shit, that guy's fucking rad looking. Like, And he was just sitting there watching a surf movie on the wall. I walked up to him. I'm like, I'm like, what's your name? And he's like, Dennis. And I'm like, where are you from? He's all Senegal. I'm like, Senegal? Like, Some of my favorite music is from Senegal. You know what I mean? I was like, holy shit, that's so rad. He was like wearing these Senegalese pants. And, and, I'm like, and we just ended up like having this heart to heart on the moment right then. And I was like, yeah, I surfed. Hanukkah how the days oh me too it was so fun yeah and like had this rat accent full French you know what I mean he speaks six different languages and so we hit it off and we became best friends like right then and we were we hung out from that day till six months later every single day right. and he had this rad little like um MG convertible MG so we'd cruise we'd tie the boards on the back of the MG and we were fucking windmills and Hanukkah how and sometimes over to Paia and surf over there and, you know, I met a bunch of those guys, Dexter and Toda and, and that crew, but, like, it was too hard to infiltrate that crew. They were pretty intimidating, you know what I mean? And so I wasn't even going to try, you know what I mean? It was like I met them. They knew who I was. I knew who they were, especially. And uh, lots of respect, but I had my scene over here. I had windmills. I lived for windmills. It's the fucking sickest wave. And, and plus it's lefts, which I grew up in the land of rights, you know what I mean? And it was like lefts, it was everything I wanted to surf, and it's a powerful one. Anyway, so me and Dennis became best friends. I ended up moving back. Me and my girl broke up. I moved back to Santa Cruz. I moved in with my sister on 34th Avenue. That was there where you had the ramp. Dennis had to go back to France because since he's from Senegal, he was supposed to do two years in the army. And so he came to Santa Cruz first and hung out for a couple weeks in Santa Cruz and made me a djembe, a big African drum. And like, we were just, you know, we we're that tight. It was like, here's your gift. And it was like wrapped in Senegalese, you know, material and like the most beautiful teak wood drum you've ever seen. So we hung out for two weeks. All the girls in Santa Cruz were like, <laughs> I was getting calls from like girls I've never had a call from in my life. They're like, okay, who's that guy staying with you? <laughs> like, what the fuck, Nelly? Like, like, it was, he was just like, he was a mystic man, you know, from Senegal. Totally fucking grew up in an outdoor school in Senegal. Whatever. So when he left, he's like, I'm going to go if I have to, do my time in, in France, and then I'm moving to Reunion Island. So he ended up going back to France, and he feigned an injury, just like in, in the summer, dude. He pulled it off, and they didn't make him go to the Army. And so he moved straight to Reunion. And he got all set up. I broke up with my girlfriend. He called me, and he's like, hey, I have a restaurant here. You should come over. And, and he heard through the grapevine through someone that like I was all bummed out because I had broken up with my girlfriend and so so I'm like fuck it you know just like you had that bright light going off where I'm moving to Central America and I made a promise to myself I'm like okay I'm moving to Reunion I went to the flea market every weekend and sold everything I was selling all my old decks and all this stuff I, was, I sold everything I owned and I made like six grand or whatever and I bought a ticket to Reunion through via through Paris, you know what I mean, and and um, and then I ended up moving there, and that was like the best. That was one of the best years of my life, like surfing San Lu, and and I lived in San Lu. I lived like fifty feet from the paddle out spot in San Lu, and it was just it was an interesting. I mean, <clears throat> I don't even know how to say how interesting it was. You know, it's such a different culture. That wave and that setup, was it like a fantasy? It was a fantasy, but also the whole scene. You know, there's Creoles and French. Everything's reggae or sege. They have all these different musics that I've never heard over there, but everything was that tone. And they had an outdoor amphitheater and reunion in, in San Lu, where I'd be out surfing San Lu, and all these bands would come from Africa and Madagascar and everywhere, and they'd play in that amphitheater. I'd be out there like surfing world-class, fucking perfect direction San Lu with like barely anyone out, 
just scoring barrels and listening to the like the the dreamest music ever it was amazing like some of the most famous bands came through that amphitheater you know from Africa and I was in heaven but it wasn't sustainable you know what I mean what were some of what was your favorite band that you ever saw in my life no that there um to tell you the truth I don't even remember their names but I knew back then you know what I mean in Africa in general uh, Yusu Endure you know who he is uh, yeah yeah so Yusu Endure was my favorite African band he's from Senegal he was unknown and Peter Gabriel went over there and discovered him brought him back to the US he was his backup singer and then when they were done with that tour the In Your Eyes tour you know what I mean then he went back to Senegal and he was like okay he learned so much and made so much money too that he opened his own recording studio there in Senegal became so big in Europe and Africa that he ended up flying Peter Gabriel and sing back up for him on his next album. You know what I mean? It was like, the whole thing is so magic. It's like, the guy's crazy. Anyway. Insane. Yeah. So in Reunion, did you kind of find a new part of yourself? Totally. Totally found a new part of myself in Reunion. It was, it was at first... When we moved there, I was in a different stage in my life. Um, I had just come off living in Maui where I was like surfing the best I had ever surfed, you know what I mean? And I had good boards. And so when I moved over there, I had a bunch of boards and I was feeling really confident and I was in really good shape. And I hadn't been doing drugs. And all of that combined with the excitement of learning French and meeting new people, which I've always been into, learning a new culture, and all the um, inspiration that the place has to offer, which is crazy, you know I mean? It's one of the most beautiful places I've been to to this day. Possibly the most beautiful. You know, one of the youngest islands in the world, so it goes basically vertical off the sea, just straight mountains like this, and it's still spewing lava, it's, it's crazy. And, um, but the main thing was surfing, obviously. And so it's one of the best lefts in the world, one of the most rippable lefts in the world, and on the right direction, one of the most hollow lefts in the world. And so when it's the perfect direction, which I got to see it in all different conditions because I lived there for a year. Um, anyway, back to, the, back to the other point was when I first moved there, I moved in this house way up on the hill, which is where that comes into. I, had a, I bought a scooter right when I got there so I could get around. And he had to weave up the mountain because it was so steep because the island's so young. It's just all the way around the island. It's straight vertical. The roads go like this. You know, you, to, you can't just go up a mountain. It's too steep. So you have to go weave, weave. So we weave way up to this house. And I moved into this house. And there was two Reunionais people and two Frenchies. And then me and my friend Jeff. And uh, they didn't speak a fucking word of English. None of them. And so when we moved in, we all just stared at each other because <laughs> we didn't speak a word of French. And so it was real quick. And then luckily the girl, there was a girl that lived there. She started, she was in school and she was learning English at that time. So she became the translator. I got really interested in learning French. So I started learning. Dennis had already been teaching me words and, and little phrases, but she started teaching me. Um, and... I learned enough to get by like pretty soon it was similar to my Spanish where it was like I know what everyone's saying or most of the time if you're speaking slow I can tell what you're saying and I can respond in a way of broken French you know what I mean and that was exciting you know all that is just like that's what life's all about learning new stuff surfing new waves like all that stuff is like everything in my fabric that I enjoy and and so then we ended up moving out of that house and we moved down to this apartment complex that's literally 50 feet from the paddle out spot. And there was a boat house in front of our house. This one local dude named Francis lived at and we became friends with him. So that was our hangout spot. And it was like the boat house, the paddle out spots, 10 feet in front of his porch. And we hung out at his house all day, every day. And all the reunion days guys and all the um, Crail people all the fishermen they all hung out there too and so we became friends with all these fishermen they'd always be kicking us fish 
and it was just the most awesome thing ever and then that became everything that I lived for that wave you know I was there at 5 30 in the morning and I would if it was pumping I was out there first guy out no matter what I wasn't scared because I had never seen one of the sharks that are there and the wave was so good there was no way I was not going out and those guys didn't paddle out till eight so I had it to myself like it, it takes a while to get out there so I'd say from 5.45 to 6 in the morning till 8 in the morning, I'd have it to myself. And I just had the most memorable, best barrels, best surf sessions, most zenned out surf sessions I've ever had where you're just sitting out there like, oh my God, there's a five wave set coming and I can have anyone I want. Like, when does that happen? It doesn't happen ever in my life and it, that was the first time I'd be paddling over I'm like nah not this one you, you'd, you'd see the hook in it you'd know which one it was because it's kind of like restaurants where it's hooking and you could see the hook and you're like this is the one Foo, drop in it was like surfing in an aquarium you could see the fire coral you could see the fish as you're dropping and you just all you had to do is make the drop and you just stand in the barrel just and it was just like that you know, I've never had that again in my life since that, where I knew that if the swell was on, I knew the directions. I was like focused on surfing in that point in my life, where I knew that like if I woke up and it was pumping, I had it to myself. These guys were scared to surf because there's a lot of fucking sharks there and people like it's a reality. There's a lot of shark attacks there, and even back then, now it's now it's like almost some of the time it's illegal to surf there's so many sharks but back then there had been like three or four gnarly fatal shark attacks and then one guy that we surfed with every day had like a paddle for an arm because he had his arm bit off by a tiger shark you know what I mean and we surfed with them all the time and so it's a reality there and people they didn't surf in the evening and they didn't surf at the crack and for me that was a dream because it was like I was willing to overlook that especially being from Santa Cruz, it's a reality there too, you know what I mean? It's like we'd surf Scott's Beach break, Beach Break all the time. It's like, it doesn't get any more sharky than that. I'm sorry to tell you, you know what I mean? So, anyway, that was definitely the best, probably the best surf time of my life, you know, and learning experiences and other... It was also interesting to live in a reunion where you're like the foreigner. Like they, there's no such thing as Americans in, in reunion. Chris Pachekas, Jeff Lannis, those are the only two ever. And then it was me after them. And we surfed some fucking crazy waves together. Indian Ocean's a different animal. Yeah. Very, very, very different than the Pacific. It's the ultimate for surf. It's the ultimate for surfing, you know, and it was just, <clears throat> being that I was away from Santa Cruz and the scene and the drugs and all of that, I was way more capable and clear-headed so that I was able to scratch enough money to go and take, buy a hundred dollar plane ticket to Mauritius and actually pull that off and go surf, you know, um, Tamarind Bay, which is every surfer, goofy foot surfer's dream. You know, I'm so happy that that was in the middle of my partying days where it was like I was partying hard and then I wasn't. And then I went through my gnarly stuff after that. But it was in the middle where I was like completely focused on surfing. My friend had a ramp there too and we'd skate his ramp all the time, you know. So I was like focused on being in shape, eating as healthy as I could with the budget I was on and surfing. And it was like everything actually revolved around San Lu. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Everything in my life, I've never been so focused on surfing. Dude, with all those endorphins and dopamine, maybe that kind of dictated your path when you came back to Santa Cruz. You didn't have that level of excitement. No. Nowhere near. Did and still like, doesn't. Still did doesn't. Did you like replace <laughs> it with something or... Did I replace the the excitement of living in reunion? Yeah, all those. For sure. I mean, I got back and it was straight back in, you know. It was like nothing. I had never left. 
obviously, as you know. You go back to Pleasure Point, and it's a party at this guy's house. These guys have got a bindi and fucking this and that. And there's like nothing had ever changed. You know, these guys, you know, they're still going to the castaways. They're still going to whatever. How would it physically happen, for example, someone like you, a bright eyed, just sparky, stoked kid, and you know, you're drinking a couple beers here and there, you're smoking a little bit of reefer. And then how does. How does it physically happen to where you end up like doing coke or like some some a harder drug? How does a gateway drug really work? Well, alcohol alcohol is the the um, the accepted one where it's like you can get it on any corner and it's it's um, socially accepted, and that's the biggest gateway drug there is. You know what I mean? So. You let your guard down. I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I didn't care. I was I was buzzed drinking. You know, what I mean, someone offers you a line, and everyone else is doing it. Why the hell wouldn't I? You know, what I mean, it was like. And in reality, my morals were against that. But being drunk or buzzed killed my morals. It o or it outweighed it. It outweighed it. It's like, oh yeah, that looks fun. Let's. And I was always the guy where it was like, I'd surf, and then I'd skate, surf and skate all day long, and then when it was over and it was getting dark, I'm like, no, like I want more. I don't want this, you know. I, like you said, the endorphins and the dopamine. It was like, I was I was, I was the guy who wanted it to keep going. You know, I'm sure most addictive personality. Guys, so yeah. Surrounding you. Yeah. Like, just saying who wants to pitch in, who's. Yeah. Like, it wasn't, you were by no means a lone wolf. I mean, it was, we were all running in a pretty deep pack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there was anything that you wanted. Yeah, at all times. Fucking tap. Yeah. So, so where did you kind of go from there? Like, what was your next chapter about? What did it. What happened? Um, I started, you know, like I, I'm a firm believer, and you are who you hang out with. Really, if you hang out with successful people, you usually become successful. If you hang out with, you know, surfers and skaters, you're going to surf and skate a lot. You know, what I mean, I started hanging out with uh, surfers and skaters that partied hard. And their path was going the wrong direction, and and mine went with theirs. Where it was like, okay, surfing and skate, you know, like even Meekster, we'd hang out and we'd be like on the way to go surf 26 all day, and we'd stop by Booker's Beach, and we'd never leave. And we'd have our boards and our suits, and they would sit there on the side of the house all day while we partied. Want to hang out and listen in? His massage is here. Uh, do you want to take it? You want me to take it? Yeah. And then mine's at one, you take mine. Perfect. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, Booker Beach, for those who don't know, what was that? What was Booker's Beach? Booker's Beach, sorry, yeah, I just. Um, so, Meekster lived on 35th, I lived on 34th. On 33rd Avenue at Pleasure Point was a house called Booker's Beach, and it was a guy named Jason Booker, and he was just a local construction dude that uh, surfed, kind of ripped, and he was down with everybody. Everybody knew him, and but he loved to party, and fucking he, you know, I mean, it was like the whole crew was like, let's go over to, he had this big, weird lot in his backyard where there, you know, occasionally there was a ramp and there wasn't a ramp. There was couches all around, fire pit. And it was just the congregation spot for the, the um, semi Darrells, The people who surfed and skated, but also just raged. And there was, you know, I mean, like every aspect of, you know, drugs, dealers, everything you can think of, chicks, and it was just always on over there, you know what I mean? It was like every day, it was an everyday thing. And so we knew better. Sometimes we, we knew better than even go by there because we knew if you get sucked in there, you're not leaving. 
And it might be days before you left, you know what I mean? And my friend Stan lived there, and even a couple chicks lived there somehow. Uh, they lived next door. There was like a duplex, right? Anyway. And explain like how close it was to the surf. Yeah. And how big a part it was of the surfing scene and checking the surf, it was like. Yeah, so 33rd Avenue was a dirt alley. It was like the dopest little, you know, that's all gone now. But back then, it was a dirt alley that ran straight to the paddle out spot at Pleasure Point. It was at like a half a block from the ocean. And this was this ghetto rundown duplex that was the leftovers of how Santa Cruz, all of Santa Cruz used to be where it was all alleys, it was all dirt alleys, it was all sleepy little town back in the day. So this was like one of the last spots that was still like that. No was, sidewalks. No, no nothing, it was dirt, you know what I mean? And, and, uh, and it was a big lot, like there's no lot there now, you know what I mean? There's no such thing as a lot in Santa Cruz, they're all bought up by millionaires. But this was like some crip lot with a, with a with a fucking thrash duplex that Slumlord had, and he didn't care. It was just like whatever, whatever goes, you know what I mean? And, and and it was all day, all night, every day party. And it was all of our crew, all of Aptos, West Siders, Midtowners. Like it was a mesh of all these people who were kind of all doing the same thing, which was like raging, drugs surfing but it was like the surfing was a sidebar of this scene now and so anyway that's what booker's beach was it was it was heavy you know what i mean like shit went down there i remember like people shooting rabbits in the yard and pinning them up to the wall with switch blades and like you know the stuff goes on and on like the stuff we saw there was it was a little more than than i liked actually because i was more not really into that dark side. I didn't like that stuff, you know what I mean? But there was a lot of that going on, you know. It was shady because it was kind of the beginning of like when the lowriders and the gangsters and the surfers all started kind of coming together under the kind of guise of drugs. For sure, for sure. And there was, you know, there was like the guys, the guys and girls who were over there just because it was a place to party and they'd have wine coolers and cloves and maybe do a line and then there was everything to a guy in the bathroom shooting up you know what i mean and everything in between and they kind of like like there was it was a very interesting place for that reason you know what i mean where it was like there was an innocent side to it and then there was a really deep dark side to it and the stuff that went down there late at night and three in the morning and stuff was you know, I've heard stories of crazy stuff going on there, you know, where it was, like you said, gangsters, lowriders, surfers and skaters, all mixing under the guise of drugs, you know, and partying. And it was wild because punk rock was kind of the soundtrack yeah. of what was going on. Yeah. So that made you want to just smash it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all of us, you know, we we grew up skating to punk rock, you know what I mean? And 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 that was a big part of Santa Cruz, you know. Like there was a lot, you know, between between what you'd listen to when you're skating Buena or club culture way back in the day, we'd go to shows and seven seconds and GBH or Dead Kennedys or whoever was there. Crazy, like all the best punk bands in the world played at Club Culture, this tiny little shanty place in downtown Santa Cruz. And I grew up on that, even though I didn't grow up in Santa Cruz, it was like I was always at Club Culture for those shows, you know what I mean? You know what's really rad is that all of us had the opportunity to like see our favorite bands and whatnot. Yeah. You were in the same category as me where you were into all of it. Yeah. So we love reggae just as much as we love punk rock. Yeah. And so we'd be going to see the Whalers and Steel Pulse one weekend and go to see the DKs the next. Yeah. At small little places. And appreciating both equally and like that formed our adult like personalities in a lot of ways. That For sure. Diversity and, I, and the diversity and also I feel like 
our hearts were in the right place, so we weren't like, oh, I have to, now that I'm punk rock, I have to be a punker, and I have to fucking have a chain wallet, and fucking ripped out everything, and mohawk, and you know what I mean? It was like, you didn't, that wasn't it. It was like, At all. It, yeah, it was the message and the energy. We were into the energy, you know what I mean? It was like, okay, I'm rebelling against this, and this is how I feel about it, but it was all from coming from a good place, you know what I mean? And same with reggae, it was like, fuck, it's, here's the po most positive vibes you can put into your body. Learn from it and grow and be a better person, you know what I mean? And uh, a lot of people don't understand punk rock, you know? But I listened to every single lyric and thought about it, you know what I mean? And it, it affected who I was for sure. It was like, you know what I mean? Um, like for instance, I don't like Slayer. I don't like their lyrics. And so I don't listen to Slayer. And all my friends do. They love it. but. I don't think they're thinking about it, you know what I mean? And I thought about it. Like when I was, li when I was listening to punk, I was like, I fucking read the lyrics to California Uber Alice and I was like, okay, like, you know, this is, wow, this is, this makes sense to me. And uh, I love that about punk rock, you know? Thing, a lot of the songs are things that really matter and they were written really carefully by these fucking geniuses who necess weren't necessarily college graduates. They were just smart people and fucking talking about things that really matter. And so I'm into that. And on top of that, I love to that, to that, to that, to that. I love that. You know what I mean? The energy. We love skating to that. It was our, well, it was was our sound, anthem. That was the soundtrack to our lives. Yeah, it was the soundtrack and to we our fucking lives. fucking pissed yeah. about a lot of shit yeah. that was going on. And that's what they're fucking screaming about yep. in those songs. Yep. And it was... Which is the same reason we, we like rap today. You know what I mean? It's like, rap, like, the cops are not fair. Exactly. You know what I mean? And that doesn't mean all cops are bad, because I, th I think there's a place for cops, but you, they should be good cops. You know what I mean? They don't be racist cops. Grew up on everything from Bob Marley to Elton John to... I mean, ELO. You know, I was just always into music. I loved it. I listened to it loud. I read the lyrics. I got into it. Were you going to say but something? That was like your sister's shit, and you, know, you liked it and whatnot. But tell us, like, for you, your own shit. Yeah. Bad Religion, Seven Seconds, like all year shit. Bob Marley was at the top of that, but, uh, you know, there was. I mean, because those weren't even my bands at all. But that yeah, was, yeah. Like you love that, and I love that shit too. Yeah. You know what I mean, but those were. If I hear those two bands, I think of you immediately. Yeah. <laughs> immediately. So all my friends, uh, you know, like I was. I guess it came from skateboarding. You know, we'd go skate Montague Banks. We met Gavin O'Brien and Corey O'Brien and Caballero and. And we'd always be listening. We had to get a blaster no matter what. Everywhere we went, whether it was Brosda's Pool, My Ramp, fucking Montague Banks, Race Street Ramp, with, you know, wherever. So, oh, and Winchester Skate Park. That was the beginning of, like, my absolute love affair with punk rock. It was like I'd go to skate Winchester. I idolized Meekster, Caballero, Poon, and these other guys that were fucking ripping the keyhole. And I would go over there, all shy, loner, loner Nelly. And I would just watch from a distance. And it was black flag on one side of the tape. And it had the auto turnover thing. Dead Kennedy's on the other side. And it would just do all day, every day. It was the same tape. It never left the thing. It was black flag. And then it was Dead Kennedy's, California Uber Alice. And then it was fucking black flag. And, and I was just like. Jealous again? Pretty sure, yeah. Yep. And, uh, and, you know, Meekster was the punk out of those guys. And, fuck, there was a few other guys I somehow cannot remember their names right now, but I know. Anyway, there was, a, there was like this punk aspect to Winchester, you know what I mean, where there was a few punkers. 
and the, and that and that's what we listened to all day every day so that was the beginning of my punk rock and and really having a love affair with it but everywhere i went we listened to minor threat we went to shows we went and saw dead kennedys birdo was a heavy punker so um you know we actually all of us were <laughs> and so it was like everywhere we went we listened to punk rock and reggae and later on in life the bad brains it was just like it, like is this too good to be true they play reggae and punk are you fucking kidding me you know all in the same song sometimes but that really was part of who I became you know I mean it was like I was rebellious I wasn't gonna let people tell me how to live and that was the anthem that we lived by as far as the toolbox goes you were a massive part of my toolbox you know I mean it was like when I met you I already knew who you were way before you knew who I was because I was a fucking I was a knowledge guy I knew who Galley was I knew who Adam was I knew who Rufo was I knew, none of you guys knew who I was you know what I mean it was like I was fucking hyper alert I knew what was going on in the surf scene I knew who was who in the lineup before I was even in the lineup. You know, I mean, I was in the lineup, but I wasn't in the lineup. I was on the fringe. I knew who Roman was and Mark Machado and fucking, you know, like which guy was gnarlier and, you know, like who to avoid and fucking watch out for Roman. He'll fucking, you know what I mean? And so anyway, when I met you, it was all different because you were this gnarly dude we all looked up to, you know I mean? Everybody from my town, from Saratoga, knew who you were, you know? You were this legendary fucking, on your way to being a legend, but famous already. Sponsored surfer, kinda had a reputation at the hook, but you had a legend, reputation as a photographer and you had a reputation in SoCal Skate Park and you were, you know I mean? It was like, there was all these different parts of you that we all knew about, you know I mean? Where it was like, like you would never even know that, you know what I mean? So anyway, I went and surfed the hook one day and Mike Coteau was there and I was surfing good. I was having a fucking heater. I was on a heater and I was like 13, maybe 14. And I was doing, I just learned backside floaters and bat, and so I was like flying down the line, pa, pa, and he like, I came in and he's like, fuck dude, that was, that was pretty sick. Grandma was tiny. And he was like, he's like, actually I'm having a team tryout at the point Saturday morning, be there at six. I'm like, oh fuck, what? So I showed up Saturday morning and the, there was no one there, you know what I mean? And I, and I was like, fuck, I was so bummed. Like, that was my shot. Like, I'll never surf that good again in front of someone that matters, you know what I mean? That was my shot. And so I was like super shy at that age, but I'm like, fuck it, I'm not letting that shy, that shot's not going by. And so I went to Curteau's surf shop. <laughs> not knowing how gnarly Mike Curteau was, you know, I didn't, I didn't know. And, and Denise was in there, his wife. And, she, and I told her the story, and she's like, oh, yeah, Mike's kind of flaky. Fuck. I'm not surprised. But let me call him. And he was in the shaping bay in the back, yeah, and he came out, and he's like, fuck, oh, I'm so sorry. Karami was so cool to me. You know what I mean? I don't know why he had this affinity for me, but he liked me. And he's like, go in, pick out any board you want right in here. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, the used ones. Make sure it's a Croteau. And I walk in there, and there's this green beautiful single fin Curteau and it said TR in it and it was like you know I had already touched on that but I knew who you were and I was like fuck that board's sick I'm grabbing that one I'm like well, can I grab this one and he's like yep no worries so I grabbed that board and I take it home and I'm you know I'm, I'm the guy who's almost sleeping with a new board you know what I mean because I'm so addicted to surfing it's everything to me so I'm waxing it and you know here I am fucking 30 miles from the ocean I'm waxing that thing I don't even know when I'm surfing again waxing it getting it ready surf it broke my leash never put a new leash on surfed it every day I was a 26th Avenue guy already by that time I was still young <clears throat> and I put all these dings in it and then and there was just pressure dings from landing on the rocks on the beach and all this stuff and then Croteau called me and he's like, dude, you got you to bring that board back. Bro, it's been months. 
And I'm like, oh, shit. So I go over to the shop. I'm, what's up? Denise was the only one there. I'm like, you brought this board back. She's like, oh, yeah, cool. Snuck it back in there, put it in the rack, put the little thing on it. And like three days later, I get a call. And it's like, is this Dave Nelson? This is Tony Roberts, dude. You owe me money. And I'm like, holy shit. I'm like, fuck. I'm like, how much? He's like, 30 bucks. You owe me 30 bucks, dude. And I'm like, fuck. Like, I had zero cents to my name, you know? And I could tell by your voice that you're pissed. And I'm like, oh my God, I just pissed off like one of my idols. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I'm fucked. So I, I did, you know, what any grandma would do. I mowed lawns and picked up rocks and all this stuff so that I could get the money. I got the money and I called you. And I went and met you at 26th Avenue. I don't know if you remember that. Do you remember that? I've heard the story so many times. It's like I do, but I don't. I don't really remember. So I remember. The, I remember the story. So the the parking my, lot. My memory is fucking shot. Dude. Yeah. So I'm, the parking lot at 26. There's the Win and Sea side. The other side. There's a little driveway right there. My friend lived in that house, and I met you there. And right when I pulled up, you're like, "I know you." You're like, "You're fucking Nelly." Or you're Dave Nelson? Like, dude, we've skated derby so many times. Like, don't even trip on the money. Fuck, that's so sick. And we ended up fucking, like, shaking hands. And if you were like, fuck, let's go fucking skate sometime. And all this stuff, you know what I mean? And it was just like, oh, it's just, it's just like, it was like I got to breathe for the first time in, like, an hour. I was like, oh, like, you know, he doesn't hate me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And now I've got a new friend. And from that moment on, we started shooting, skating. You brought me to Soquel. We started skating Buena. You filmed me and you put me in your bro role, which was like, I was so honored, you know what I mean? And it was like, that was a huge part of who I became because all of a sudden you know, I went from an outsider to I was one of the boys, kind of, you know what I mean? And that's. Raiders of the Lost Park. Yeah, all that, you know. Island. But just just hanging out on Kala or, or Wardy's house or whatever and showing a bro roll and I was in it, it was like, that was, <laughs> you know, as high as I could possibly think at that time. Yeah. You couldn't get any bigger, you know, other than like maybe throwing out the first pitch at a Giants game, you know what I mean? That was the pinnacle, you know. So I don't know where I was going with all that, but like that was a, a huge part of who I became. Oh, the toolbox, yeah. So the toolbox was always, I mean, the toolbox is always growing in my opinion. But back then it was, it came a lot from my parents. You know, I had two really fucking rad parents. My mom was the coolest, most liberal, Loving, giving, caring, public health nurse, awesome person. Not just as my mom, but that's who she was, you know what I mean? My dad was gone a lot when I was a kid, but he was uh, also 110% got my back at all times. So I was extremely fucking lucky, and I didn't know how lucky I was, but I was super lucky to have the, they were a big part of my toolbox, and still are. Then it became make your own toolbox, and so that's why that came out. It was like the beginning of meeting you, and you introducing me to all these people. You know how it is, it's like, I met everyone, you know what I mean, it was like, it's hard to explain, but I rock up with T. Now Nate Acker knows who I am, or Galley. Gal got me and Galley were already friends, but like Tim Ward, Warfy, da 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 da. Like it goes on. It's all of a sudden. It's like, hey, if you're cool with T, then you must be fucking cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that became a huge part of my toolbox, and watching you do what you do, and I, it was like. I was really into skating and shooting with you and that was like a huge goal of mine but at the same time I was always very interested in what you did, you know what I mean? 
and how you shot your photos and what aperture you were on and what you why you were shooting slides you you told me you're like these are fucking slides right here i don't shoot you know you're shooting negatives like you can never do anything with those you know what i mean you and birdo both taught me that like you're shooting like and i was like i don't care i just like shooting photos and these prints are good enough for me i don't have a plan to be a professional photographer you know what i mean but throughout the time watching you work and watching you shoot skating and surfing and shoot slides and submit them and all that stuff watching your stuff on the slide table looking at that stuff i learned so much you know what i mean and so that became part of my toolbox the most important part of my toolbox is being around people that are compliment your compliment you people that are cool and nice and respectful to others you know what i mean that's my toolbox if you're not those ways then you're not part of my toolbox you know what i mean I might be friends with you, but you're, you're always kept outside the toolbox. You're not never inside the toolbox because that's not who I am. You know what I mean? I like compassion and, and being that way, you know what I mean? And it was like, that was one of the reasons you and I clicked. It was like we were all into the same thing. It was like compassion, surfing, skating, reggae, punk. It was all part of who we were. 100%. You know what I mean? And it wasn't, we weren't listening to punk because we were angry at the fucking world. It was because we want solutions in our life. And what was happening wasn't working. And so we were fucking letting everybody know that that's not working. Fuck you. And you're not going to control me. That's my toolbox. My, I mean, like the, now the, the toolbox for me goes on to many, many different facets. And it's huge, you know. Uh, now what we're talking about is a long time ago. Uh, yeah. And the foundation. And the foundation. That went into present day. Yeah. But tell, like, before we leave, like, that era, you know, um, tell us about how you kind of slid into drugs. Because leading up to this point, it just doesn't, doesn't make sense. With the rest of the story. I think, you know, there's a bunch of reasons, mainly because I'm so type A personality where it was like, like the surfing and skating was like a party to me. It gave me all this endorphins and dopamine and you know what I mean? And it was like when surfing and skating, when it wasn't possible anymore, like you remember, we would surf in the morning then we'd go to Derby, then we'd go cliff jumping at the lane, then we'd go back to Derby, then we'd go to SoCal, and then like the day would be over, party. then we'd go party. And do it again in the morning. You were always down. Always. One of the only people who could match my energy. Yeah. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, you know, I think it was just a natural progression of trying different drugs and, you know, I'm pretty anti-drugs for that reason. It's like, I mean, not pretty, but you know, I mean, it's like they're, it's a progressive disease with anybody. There might be one or 2% of people that can do a line of Coke and walk away from it and go talk to everybody and then go home and sleep. It just doesn't stay like that, you know, for anybody in the world. A big part of it is a personality. It's a personality, yep. My type A personality is an attribute and it's also a detrimental for addiction for addiction you know and so i slid into that because i wanted the party to always keep going and i was a yes man and it was like i i you know my my morals slid away one at a time where it was like oh yeah i'll try that oh yeah i'll do that okay and it you know it's a progressive disease and it progressed slowly at first and then really fast when it when it got a hold of me when the ad addiction set in with you know with drugs it was like nothing else mattered you know what i mean and even though it did matter it didn't matter it was that strong and slowly i stopped surfing and i stopped skating and it became all about that and and uh, I 
you, you, you change. And it wasn't, for, it wasn't a good change. You know, most of my change in life has been good. Like, change is good. This was not a good change. This was a bad change. And it was like... The, the the term do whatever it takes, you know what I mean, is is what happens in addiction, you know what I mean? And if I had to like ride my bike from Seventh Avenue to Aptos to, to get a bindi, <laughs> that's what I would do. Even if it had a flat tire, it was like fucking I'm going. You know what I mean? And uh, and and luckily for me that's how I am with everything in life. Like it you know, I don't let things f I'm not afraid to go do whatever it takes to to get what I want and that's been a good thing later on in life but during this time it was really bad and it got really ugly for a few years where I was like you know I didn't eat and I lost weight and my hair was falling out and I was just like I wasn't a shell of who I used to be you know what I mean and it was like deep inside I knew I was still in my heart I was a surfer and a skater and I wanted to be that still, but I wasn't that anymore. You know, now I was just a, a druggie. And luckily for me, I made it out without, you know, going to jail. I never went to jail, you know what I mean? I never, uh, there was a lot of luck involved or, or good karma. I'm not sure which, you know what I mean? But... I learned so many valuable lessons through that. I was like, I wouldn't change it at all. How did you bottom out? Um, I just hit this crazy rock bottom where I was like, oh, I actually OD'd. The big bottom out was actually, so I gotten clean, went to rehab. I had, a, I, I had OD'd and I'd gotten clean. I went to rehab. I had everyone's trust back again and then I relapsed. And then the relapse was like three months long and it was gnarly and basically sold everything I owned and lost my house again. You know, I had gained everything back, lost everything and then went hard. And I finally went downtown and I called my sister and I'm like, Kim, I don't fucking know what to do. I don't know what, I don't know how to quit. I don't know what to do. What do I do? Tell me what to do. Like, you know what I mean? It was like, I was on a, fucking 10 speed with a flat tire at a phone booth on River Street and I'd been avoiding everyone I know because I owed everyone money so I was like scared to go to Pleasure Point I'd bounce checks to people da, 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 da. I'm just crazy and you know my parents had told me a while before like don't come over here you know what I mean so I had nowhere to go and uh that was my rock bottom. It was gnarly. And I was just like, fuck, I have no idea what to do. I had no food. I had no money. I had no nothing. Coming down hard. And I was what on a bike. Coke. And, uh, sniffing it or smoking it? Smoking it. You know what I mean? And it was just, it had a hold of me. You know? And I, like, I would go days and days without eating, dude. Like, days and days. At all. And, uh, it's funny because I go back over it now. I'm like, how did I fucking do that? Like, how did I support that? I, I didn't have a job, and I, and I was, I was way too out of it to like sling weed or anything. I don't, I don't even remember. I don't remember what my hustle was, but it was must have been fucking decent. You know what I mean? And uh, so you were kind of downtown, and that it's almost kind of a slash like homeless drug like subculture in a way. Not really downtown, actually. Okay. I was more in the like. You know, I don't want to name off people too much, but there was a crew in Santa Cruz. They were all doing the same thing as me, and they all had houses spread out between SoCal and, you know, certain houses in the Midtown and whatever, and it was like the, everyone was doing the same thing, you know, they're kind of before, I guess, smoking like crack. And after that, it would be isolated, like in the flats and all that, right? Like kind of... What would be? Just if you got into that kind of subculture, you'd end up downtown. Right? Well, that's where you'd buy it. You know, okay. you'd buy it in the flats, but you wouldn't do it in the flats or you hang out in the flats. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was never a needle guy. Never shot up anything, so I wasn't that. Um, I wasn't that type of junkie. And I had a lot of friends still, 
in Santa Cruz, they're all doing the same thing as me. We all fell into the same puddle. And so they're, you know, sporadically spread around town. I would jump from house to house to house, you know, and spend the night here and then spend the night there and then figure out how to get more and then go over here. And when you were, when, if you had it, you were welcome. <laughs> you know what I mean? Anyway, I hit rock bottom, called my sister. She's like, ride that fucking piece of shit bike up to, up to the new life center. Check yourself back in there. Fair Avenue on the west side, you know, I'd already gone through it, but I didn't finish the program, you know what I mean? And I was like, after four months, I was like working at Aerosurf Shop, and I was fucking, I was cured, basically, thought I was, even though there is no cure for addiction, you know what I mean? And I was like, oh, I'm good. And they're like, no, don't leave. You're about to graduate, you know what I mean? I'm like, nah, I'm good. I found this house right above Cow's Beach Surf Shop. And it was like, you know, I loved the wharf, surfing the wharf. I thought I was, you know, I had a job. I was, I was good. I get stuff back really fast, you know what I mean? I was healthy. I eat peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I was tan. I was surfing. I was skating. I was shooting photos. And I thought I had it all back going, you know what I mean? But I didn't. I hadn't learned my lesson. So I relapsed. That's when I was calling my sister she told me to go back to new life I went back I walked in there and my counselor took one look at me and they're like holy fuck I'd lost like 50 pounds since I left for three months she's like oh my god because they don't let people just walk in you know what I mean like you have to go through this gnarly fucking callback thing all this stuff to, but she made an exception <laughs> she's like Nelly you're gonna die um we're going to make an exception for you, but we're going to need you to go to Janice first and detox. So they bust me over there, which they don't do for anybody either. You know what I mean? They gave me a ride over there. They checked me in. I, I detoxed over there. And then that was it for me. It was like, okay, I never want to feel like that ever again. Like to the point where I'll do whatever it takes. <clears throat> and they had this class at, at New Life Center, what's called Relapse Prevention. And the guy, E-Man, that taught that class, who I'm still in touch with this to this day, was a genius. And he knew every single part above your brain and which drug affects, affects which part of your brain. You know, your cerebellum and why cocaine does this to this part of your brain. This is what it releases this is why it takes so long to come back from meth and oxys, but it only takes three days to come back from cocaine, which is why people keep going through this vicious cycle. Because it's like, you come down from coke, you feel like shit, you swear you'll never do it again. Three days later, you feel like, ah, I'm all good. Let's get a bindi. You know what I mean? That's why. Whereas with meth and oxy, it, you don't come back. It takes like a year for your serotonin to come back and your um, dopamine and all the... And anyway, I went gung-ho into that. I was like taking notes. I was the guy who was not going to relapse no matter what, you know what I mean? And that program is actually super sick because they make you go to three meetings a night, whether it was NA, AA, doesn't matter what it is. And you start to learn... First, first you start to meet people, but you start to learn which type of program works for you. You know what I mean? And, and most, most addicts, it's all the same. It's just you need to work the 12 steps and you need a sponsor and that's it. And you need to realize that it's not about willpower. Willpower is actually your enemy. It's about being powerless. I'm powerless. And that's why, you know, Anyway, I could go on forever about the program because I'm fucking 100% behind it. And it's like how to be a better person and how to be a better friend and how to be a better partner and how to... That's what I learned. And it's been a fucking miracle, you know what I mean? Since, since that... I don't even remember when my last hit was. It's been so long. But I do remember that it, uh, that misery, and I never want to feel like that again. And I never, and and you know, for today, I know I'm not going to get loaded. That's that's the truth. You know what I mean? Tomorrow, 
it's a different day, but I only live one day at a time. And I fucking love it. You know what I mean? Life is so precious and so golden. So crazy, you know? It's good shit. It's incredible. What I learned from all that was that drugs are more powerful than anybody's brain chemistry. And so anybody who thinks that they're going to go and just do one and they're going to be different than the other person because they're them and those guys are gnarly and you're not, you're tripping. Because drugs are more powerful than your brain chemistry and, and <clears throat> um, there's an exception to every rule, but you know, not when it comes to that shit. Not when it comes I mean, to that shit. Brain, not when it comes you know, to that shit. I mean, it doesn't take much. I guess what I mean by that is there are people who have snorted coke and didn't become an addict like me. Yeah. But for the most part, it's like fucking not, yeah, not, exactly. Not forty times. No. And didn't become an addict. No. Yeah. Nobody ever. Nobody ever smoked a hundred cigarettes and wasn't an addict. Yeah. Care what anyone says. It's true. There's, there's, there's personality type, there's addiction, and then there's chemical fucking substances that will fucking hook you. Yeah. And the easiest way to stay clean is just to never use in the first place. You know, I mean, getting clean is a nightmare. And I wouldn't wish it on my worst fucking enemy. Because, like I said, it's, it's easier to stay clean than to get clean. You know what I mean? And I, I have so many friends that have gone out and I thought that they'd be right back and then they died. Over the last 26 years, I've seen, watched at least 15 of my either very good acquaintances or really good friends die from drugs. And, and you know, probably, you know, more, you know. That death, you know what I mean, of them, almost corresponds with a certain death of a certain side of you. Yeah. I'd like to think, which is super symbolic because most people listening to this right now feel like they grew up with you. Yeah. Because they've seen your photos for so many years and known your name and known about you and, and your positive energy. And so for a lot of them, your story starts right here. Yeah. You went through all that. And not only for them, but for yourself, did it feel like a rebirth when you came out of there and put all that type A personality into something productive and become, creative? Become your career. Yeah. Take us through it. Oh, I mean, I like to think of it as a perfect storm because there was so many things involved in my becoming who I became after drugs and alcohol and getting clean and that part of my life like it wasn't just one thing it wasn't because I was a good photographer it wasn't because I was a good swimmer it wasn't because I was a good surfer it was, wasn't because it was a perfect storm of all of it. And it was also because I knew you and because I had so much respect for you and I was already shooting photos. I wasn't willing to submit to any magazines or O'Neill or anyone because I knew the rules and the rules were you didn't step on your friend's toes or other photographers toes in Santa Cruz. That was the rules. And I watched and listened to you and Barbara and Ron Edwards and all these guys create these fucking systems with bracelets and it was like, whatever. You guys didn't poach each other's crews, and I was not going to be that guy ever that was, especially, actually, solely with you, was the only one who really mattered to me. You know, I mean, I wasn't, I knew who Klopp was, I was friends with Ron Edwards, but it was like those guys didn't even, they weren't even part of the picture. It was just you. And so when you told me you were moving to Costa Rica, it was like, okay, I'm fucking. I'm going to see what happens now. I'm going to start submitting, you know what I mean? Because I was already shooting slides. I was getting ready. But I didn't know what to do because I didn't want to bum you out. And so I didn't do anything. I just waited and it was just like, you know, at some point I probably would have gone for, to you for a blessing. 
And I would have said, hey, T, what, what should I do with my photos? You know what I mean? But I didn't have to wait for that because you decided to move to Costa Rica and you came to me and you said, no. I love that you're into photography and it's sick you're shooting water shots and I've actually seen a couple fucking sick ones and I'm stoked. So run with it because this could be the beginning of your freedom from active addiction, from you knowing me, knowing that I had no skill set. I wasn't, never did construction. I never was an electrician. I didn't have an education. You knew that I was a, a creative person, but anyway, you were looking out for me, which was awesome <laughs> and a huge part of my toolbox, you know what I mean? But when you left, you brought me all that, you know, I don't even remember exactly what it was. I remember it being catalogs, maybe a housing, a lens maybe that you didn't need that went on my Canon camera and or photography and, books. But more importantly, you're blessed. More importantly, your blessing. It was like fucking here's Mark Tinkus's number at O'Neill. Because I'm not gonna be shooting in wetsuits anymore. That's what you said. And I was like, fuck. And I went straight in there. You know what I mean? It was like fucking within three months of you leaving, I got that photo of Adam Repogel. And brought it in there and like, whoa, this is fucking sick. We don't need it, but you should send it somewhere. And I sent it to Surfer Magazine and they put it on the cover. It was like that fast. And that was the beginning, you know what I mean? And it was like, like anything else in my life, learning, like learning a backside boneless, it was like, fuck, I did it. And then I got really good at him really fast, you know what I mean? And I, I could do backside boneless on anything from like learning it on a curb on the street to like bros this pool in like a month. You know what I mean? And so when I got that cover, it was like the gnarliest, like Barney calls it, cover acid ever. And I was fucking off and running. And that, like you know, once you get a cover, everybody takes notice. They're like, okay, that's the guy. That's the guy that we want to shoot with because he's getting covers. You know what I mean? And, and it was awesome because you were getting covers at the same time down here. And then I was getting covers up there and it was fucking like, my dream come true, you know what I mean? It was like, it's not like I wanted to be TR, but I loved who you were. And you were arguably my biggest idol, you know what I mean? Because you surfed, you ripped, you skated, you fucking ripped. <laughs> you listened to punk, you listened to reggae, you made these bro roles for everybody which was like out of the kindness of your own heart. It's like, hey, I'm not gonna just be a professional photographer. I'm gonna make my friends a part of all this. And it's like, you know what I mean? Like these people who are a big part of Santa Cruz scene and surfing and they rip, you have to make sure that they get some too. And like, I watched that and was like blown away on how you were able to include the whole community in your photography and make people feel special, you know what I mean? That, to me, is selflessness. And that's fucking everything in life, you know what I mean? And everybody I like to include myself around and be around is people that are selfless, not selfish. Like, the people who just talk about themselves and, like, I, I just tend to, like, feel myself pulling away slowly. But, like, when it's like that, amazing. So anyway, it wasn't that I wanted to be exactly like you or BTR, I wanted, I, I, but you were like my biggest influence, hands down. And so to, to get something like a cover and be successful in that way made me a proud of myself, but also really grateful that I knew you, you know what I mean, and was able to grow up around someone who gave me that much inspiration, knowledge, and your time that you put into me, you know what I mean? It's like we shot so much shit for so many companies. I don't think, I don't know how much, if you ever sold an ad, but it doesn't matter, <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't matter because look at the payoff that we got. We got this eternal friendship, respect for each other, fucking whatever. Whatever we got, it's magic, you know what I mean? And 
trying to only shoot three frames, but yeah. five going off, you're like, no! Exactly. I know that one well. So it's, this is a fucking Radis trajectory. I mean, because a great story or a great movie, it's got these ups and downs, these challenges, these conquers. So here we are coming out the back end of just, God, half a lifetime of all this stuff. And, and you, you're kind of reborn. You know, you, you, you're getting clean, you're shooting, you're putting all that energy into, into shooting and instantly getting satisfaction and results, which just feeds your new kind of focus. Focus and addiction, you know what I mean? Yeah, it was like a healthy addiction, you know what I mean? And it's addiction. like there's nothing better, in my opinion, than a healthy addiction. So explain to us, this is such an incredible chapter because... Like what a lot of people don't understand about surf photography is that it's not always the best photo or the best surfer or who deserves it gets it. No. A lot of it is very politics. rarely. Very rarely. A lot of it's politics. A lot of it's like just all these different factors. But it happened to me in the early nineties and it happened to you when I left that we were the flavors of the month. The yeah. politics went our way. We got more than we deserved at times. Yeah. Because those politics just happened to slide our direction. So in the incredible circumstance of you kind of coming out of the deepest part of your life, not only do you get fulfill your dream of getting published and it's with a cover, but you embark on Basically, we kind of left like a slot for all you, for the next generations, for the rock holes, the, the next guys. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because a lot of guys didn't make that transition of me leaving. They didn't pull it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then yeah. some pull, semi pulled it, and a whole new like group of young lions came up that were ready to shoot. Yeah. Full on personalities who fucking ripped. With these flamboyant colors and colors. airbrushes, and yeah. And all the shit that I kind of like preached, like that you needed to do, you guys just took it like to the next level. Yeah. And so, <laughs> God, there's so much to like touch on, on on this chapter, but you're coming in hot with the flashes. And the, so you're trying new stuff, you're accomplishing it, you're getting the rewards. Oh, it was through it. Oh, okay. So, um, shortly after, uh, you know, I, shortly after my first cover, I started doing lots of trips. Um, Reef was getting a hold of me, and Volcom was getting a hold of me. I started shooting a lot with you know those teams, and uh, doing lots of trips, and and. I'd go down to Surfing Magazine, which is who I started with, and meet with Flame and Pete Terrace and other, Scott Weiner, all these guys, and they would like, just like you said, if you go in the slide table there and you see there's 10 shots on the fucking slide table, go look at them and see how gnarly they are because of those are the ones. You know what I mean? And so I'd go down there and Flame would be like, come look at this shit, dude. And it would be like Van Lennup fucking behind the whatever, like cave rock or, or a pipe. And he would show me some of the archival like Flame's vault shit. You know what I mean? For some reason, he probably because I was your protege or whatever, he, would, he liked me. And so he would, be, he would talk to me about lighting and fucking the importance of this and that. And you know, and uh, I was just blown away. I'm like, <laughs> so that's when I learned about the politics and why these photos weren't published that are fucking A++ that are sitting here. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, well, we ran one of this guy a year ago or 11 months ago. We don't really, you know, and he's not the flavor of the month. So we have these gold ones, but like we're actually looking for stuff of Kelly right now. You know what I mean? Or whatever it was. And um, so I learned pretty quick that you got to get creative as hell. They're not going to run a photo of 26th Avenue shot straight out to sea 
because the lighting was good and the guy's doing an area. I mean, you better be moving down the beach or you most likely I was swimming mainly because I was willing to swim at all times and I was, I had so much energy and so much gumption to, to wake up at the crack, mainly probably learned that from you too. It's like, hey, first lights for fucking editorial and after the first 15 minutes, you better have some sponsors I can sell some ads to. Because that's, that's what you just missed out on. You know, if you weren't there for that first 15 minutes, you just missed out on your editorial. Because we're working for Flame, and Flame doesn't do fucking midday light, bro. You know what I mean? And I listened to you, and you were harsh. And, but that made me concentrate on what you were saying. You know what I mean? So anyway, I started to get more. I, start, I, I was always swimming. And I was ready for anything, you know what I mean? And shortly after that first trip with Jolson Teo and whoever else, Dane Reynolds, I was with to Cabo when they were teeny groms, I was on the Chopu, you know what I mean? And I'll, the next thing I knew, I was swimming at Chopes, and I was like, holy shit, this is fucking gnarly. Like, a year ago, I was fucking in this drug house, and now I'm swimming Chopes, you know what I mean? And I was in the best shape ever already. You know, I was like full on fucking mad dog with calves that were like way bigger than fucking Tommy Carroll's. You know what I mean? It was like I was swimming all day, every day, basically. Anytime it was sunny, I was out there. And it was also the era of the Murph Bar where there was this perfect Murph Bar left and right at the harbor. And we were shooting water there every day. And guys were coming up to Santa Cruz to shoot with me. And... We started shooting Flash. I started getting into Flash. I went down and uh, I, I forget who I talked to, but I, I always watched you shoot Flash. And shot with you a number of times when we were shooting Flash at, at skateboarding too. You know what I mean? It was like Flash and the, it just made sense. So that was the raddest thing because I didn't like the day to end still. I still like to surf and skate and shoot all day mainly shoot but when the day was over I was like fuck the day's over like what am I going to do with all this energy I still got you know I mean oh I can shoot flash now and so I would it would usually be a morning crew an afternoon crew and then a flash crew and there were three different crews because these guys were all tired you know what I mean and I wasn't tired I was ready to go so shortly after I started shooting flash I, I figured out that if we had a slave you could fucking really get something different you know what i mean and i you know i had shot enough skate photography myself and shot with you enough to see what the difference a slave made and so i i had discovered this guy sean labrie at spl water housings and he was making my housings as fast as, as fast as i was ordering them you know what i mean and i told him i want to what's the best slave potato masher okay what's the best what's the best actual like a radio slave or an ultra slave what do i want he's like ultra slave like this is the one like the second your flash goes off this one goes off every time and it's not a radio slave because a lot of times radio slaves they won't fire in the water you know what i mean and that, that was the difference in between what i was doing is everyone was shooting radio slave stuff and it was like not firing and so they would get a good one but the best one the flash didn't go off you know what i mean mine went off every time and so who did that first with the slave? Um, with the with the radio slave or the slave? Was or anyone swimming with a, yeah? Uh, I think Tom Carey was the, the actual first one. Like Sonny never. But did me it? and him, Sonny was just Flash. He, he did. He didn't use. Flash, he didn't use slave. Yeah. But Tom Carey used. Me and Tom Carey were getting them built at the same time, but he got the one, the first one in Costa Rica published. But we were both shooting at the same time after we had talked to Steve Sherman about it, you know what I mean? And so we both were like firing them off at the same time and his came out first. So I was stoked because his was sick. It looked like a lightning bolt fucking going through the water. I was like, wow, you know what I mean? Now I look at that photo and it's like not as gnarly as it was then. But it's it still so gnarly. It just all those first, first 10 shots of yours and his at yeah. that same time were just game changers. But yours was firing every time. It was firing every time because I wasn't using a radio slave. So and so, like, if it was underwater, it didn't matter with my slave. If Tom's was underwater, it wouldn't fire. Right. Now, or, you know. 
So then you start it's a messing signal. Messing with the gel filters and the. So with my with my flash, it wasn't a signal. Right. It was a burst yeah. of light made it go off. You know what I mean? And it was like a millisecond, so it was fast enough to where the the frame was gonna pick it up. You know, we were never shooting over. Exactly. Um, the gels, yeah, like the gels was that was all my idea. I'm like, let's get some fucking gels going and see what happens, you know. And and, and I, the first one I did was a red gel, and and most of the photos didn't Nate come out. Lopez? I think it was Corey Lopez. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and he did some big layback, and I was like, fuck, that looks so mental. I hope that comes out, you know what I mean? And then I got the film back, and I was like. Looked like red. It would look like red wine was like flying off his board, and it was like nothing I'd ever seen. You know what I mean? And I didn't know that this stuff was groundbreaking. You know what I mean? I was just that psyched on fucking surfing photography and what I was doing, and that I had this path in life where I could actually do something that like I could be proud of. You know what I mean? Rather than just being a surf skate Daryl and fucking just partying and whatever and it was like oh I can fucking do something that's positive in the fucking world you know it was a different concept for me you know must have been so gratifying it took me a long time to grow up I was fucking yeah, I still am you know I still am that way like immature in, in certain ways where it's like I'm Peter Pan you know I mean I don't want to grow up but <laughs> we're old now you know what I mean but it's different it's, it's different it's different now but then it was like, that was my first sniff of like, okay, I don't have to work in a kitchen or be a waiter or a busboy or fucking this or that. You know what I mean? It was like a, all of a sudden, thanks to you and many other people in my life, but mainly, you know I mean? You and me is who I, I give you a lot of credit to that and my work ethic is why I got where I got to that point where I was like fuck I can do something different and creative and rad with my life and it was a weird thing dude because I didn't have a fear of success at all but I just didn't have that like faith that I would ever be that you know what I mean your timing at that exact juncture in time was super like poignant, poignant because all of this era's greatest greats were little kids that just happened to shoot with Nelly. Yeah. John John, Jordy Smith, Dane Reynolds go down the line. Yeah. Like they're very, so a lot of their first photo shoots and <clears throat> We're with you. Yeah. And so you had to have known that you were working with some, like... Savant. Savant. So I did, forever, for sure. Like, I remember the first Dane photos I ever saw. First time I ever heard of Dane Reynolds were your photos. Yeah, rad. And he, I think, like, Body Glove or something? Quicksilver, or no, it was... Uh, Rip Curl. Rip Curl. There's a Rip Curl kid, yeah. So what was he like? Because, I mean, what a, what a different sort of personality and talent, you know, was he? Tell us about Young Dan and, and how your guys' dynamic working together, your personality and his. Yeah, so my very first trip to, with Dane was that reef trip that I was telling you about, and he was probably 12 or 13 years old, super buck teeth, fucking little grom rad personality like classic and and we hit it off totally and i hit it off with his parents so it was like if i was going on the, if dane was going on a trip and i was there those parents were stoked because a they knew i was sober b they knew i was a good influence you know what i mean and that was the most important thing to a parent they didn't care how good of a photographer you were it was like fuck he's going with nelly he's going to be good like nelly's not at the bar nelly's not being you know passing whatever you know what i mean and um so we did a lot of shooting his mom flew him up to santa cruz in a little uh cessna one time dropped him off at watsonville airport i picked him up we took him to i took him to my house and he stayed with me 
And we shot all over the place from Sewer Peak to fucking Big Sur. And water shots, everywhere we went was water shots, water shots, water shots. I tried to get him to paint his boards. He said, hell no, I'm from Ventura. We don't do that down there, you know what I mean? So I painted it for him at night when he was asleep. And then he was like, fuck, Nelly. He's like, I can't use it. Like, I'll shoot with you with the... I'll shoot with this here, but I'll never surf this board again when I go home. <laughs> and I was like, fuck, I'm sorry, dude. He was like, that's all good. So that was the shot that got published from that trip, too. The paint job that I did on his board. Anyway, we had a good relationship for a long, long time. And then, you know, he kind of, he got, he just got really, really big. And as you know, what happens with, with those guys, they get their own photographer. And so me and Dane kind of drifted apart. And recently, have rekindled our fucking working relationship and friendship, you know what I mean? Where it was like, I was stoked because we were beyond a working relationship, we had a friendship, you know what I mean? And that kind of fell off the, kind of fell off but just because he was on his own tour, you know what I mean? And he was, he was gone all the time and if he wasn't gone, he was raising a family, a new family in, in Ventura. But recently he's been coming up and we've been hanging out and we went back to the Pata down in the, you know, I mean, the back to where we started, and it was classic. We were on the beach laughing about it, telling stories, and then, you know, it was awesome. And just watching him become who he's become, which is one of the most influential surfers of all time, for sure. And obviously, the kid's favorite, you know, I mean, maybe for the last five, ten years. One of the gnarliest surfers ever, you know? One of the most unpredictable and powerful and one of the best air guys, too. All of it. So. Remember when he, he like, faced off against Slater and France? And yeah. He was, like, poised to take over the whole world and he didn't even want it. No. Did that surprise you? It didn't because a lot of the people that you and I have shot, you know what I mean? Like, there's very few that want to be world champ, really. They just want to be a really good pro surfer and live that lifestyle, you know what I mean? And then there's the guys like Kelly, who that's most important to him, is winning. And Andy, too, was that, too. It was just like, fucking, I want to win. So to take it from those guys with a half-ass approach is never going to happen. No. And then Dane was almost bummed when he made the tour, <laughs> you know what I mean? He wanted to keep doing what he was doing. He was like very successful from a young age. When he was Rip Curl, way back then, I did a bunch of trips with him in that era. Not just that one, but like a bunch of ones. And uh, he was already getting paid bank. He was the golden child and everybody knew it. We'd go on trips and there'd be five guys there. Everybody knew he was the golden child and they knew he was gonna be the guy that was the guy out of all these kids even though the, all of the rest of them ripped, Gabe Kling and Tommy O'Brien and all these kids that rode for Rip Curl, they all knew that Dane was the guy. And he was already not only better at surfing than them, but he was already chosen, you know what I mean? By the team managers, by the photo editors. At that point, Dane was still young. He was like 13, you know what I mean? Right, so those other guys went. So this is early. But you were shooting with John John that same year, and he was what, six or some shit? I was shooting with John John and he was a golden child, but he wasn't the California golden child. This is like the California rip curl team. You know what I mean? It was like, they were like, they, there was all these guys, they all fucking ripped, but Dane was the golden child. You know what I mean? And everybody knew it. First of all, because he was punting through 60 airs at fucking 12 years old, like huge ones. And like everyone else was, this was when they were fairly new still. You know what I mean? And you know, had him on lock and, and everything else too. And he was teeny, you know what I mean? And he had a lot of time to grow into all this stuff. 12 or 13 years old, you know. He was the youngest kid on the crew almost every time that we went on a trip and he was the best. Do you have any classic stories like he forgot his passport or like early day in? Situation. Early Dane, he was pretty shy, you know. Um, yeah, and 
actually he was really shy and and I don't know if I have any of those stuff. let me think let me think about that you know I mean one of the, the, the best story I have is when I painted his board you know what I mean the look on his face in the morning was like priceless he was like the what fuck kind of drama? was he like down for whatever like eat any kind of food or was he like picky and kind of like what kind of drama was he um, Dane, when he was young, was just um, fairly a good kid. You know, I mean, it was it was uh, actually not fairly. He was a good kid. He had good parenting, and so he wasn't the kid who was sneaking off and trying to drink and smoke ciggies and fucking. You know, I mean, n- never. I'm not sure what happened later on in his life, but at that point, um, he was just focused and. I think that whole not wanting to make the tour thing came later. I think when he was a kid, he was focused on making the tour and being the best surfer in the world. And he had a chance to you know, be the best surfer in the world, for sure, and, and kind of became one of the best surfers in the world, in my opinion, and many others. You know? But um, he was very focused, and, and uh, I got his first cover shot at Pasquale's, and that was pretty cool, even though the photo wasn't my favorite photo it was just a close out barrel you know what I mean but it wasn't it, it was uh, it, you know for me that's one of my favorites because it was Dane's first cover you know what I mean and it was cool and he liked it you know what more can you ask for yeah but he was as far as funny stories of Dane he was just a fucking rad kid you know what I mean He's just a rad kid. There was, a, there was a lot of kids that I was shooting with in that. Travis Mellum and like there was all these kids. But Dane was like magnetic. You know, he liked to be around him because he was, he was cool and he was, he was funny. Um, sarcastic. Shy. And so it was like when you got, when you pulled it out of him, you'd fucking laugh your ass off because he was, he was character. And you'll still, you know, still, like, we had that same experience down in Big Sur recently when we went down there and shot. We were laughing because it was like we were trying to shoot this ad and, and, and it was shit house basically, but he was ripping. We got the shot, obviously, but it was, like, funny because we were forcing it the first time we shot there when he was a little kid, and we were forcing it this time, you know what I mean? So we were just laughing because he doesn't like to force it. Dane doesn't need to force it, you know what I mean? He's doing quite fine. But we had fun. There was horses, and they came and fucking ate out of our hands, and we were laughing, and we were filming clips and fucking joking around and having picnics on the beach at Garapata, and it was just, like, the most awesome day. And it had nothing to do with, like, the fact that we needed to shoot for the magazine or, any, you know, like, all that was in the past. Yeah. And this was just let's have fun and fucking... That was probably our first time ever shooting where it wasn't about that. Of all the shots, of all the Hawaii trips, of all the um, Mexico trips, and Costa Rica we went together, and Cabo we went everywhere together all, all those years. And this is the first time where we were just fucking cruising and laughing and having fun and, and talking story and, and shooting. But it didn't matter, you know what I mean? It wasn't like some like, oh, we need to get this cover shot or else we're, you know what I mean? It was like there was none of that, which is cool. I love that. So at that point in time, you became like, you were getting as much coverage as any other photographer pretty much. And all the other photographers, it was almost kind of like a changing of the guard right then. Like a lot of the guys kind of from my generation were kind of phasing out and a lot of new guys were kind of coming in. But who were some of your favorite like magazine guys photographers that inspired you a lot like on surfing and surfer magazine hmm. back in the day other than yourself um, Don King because of his fisheye work at Pipe you know what I mean Avi Van Lena Avi but like the, uh, of the older generation or to now you're talking about like before I was kind of talking of, I want to say kind of like the older generation and yeah. also your generation. You know what I mean? Because your generation, there's a bunch of guys that came in hot. 
And then now there's a, a, new, a whole new generation, of course, but... So when I grew up, I was watching everyone as I was very hyper aware of what was going on as far as, you know, so yourself, Van Lena, um, Don King, but uh, Hornbaker, Cloth, Barber, you know, like I, I've stared at fucking Barber's shot of Rory Russell at pipe with the finger fucking touching yeah. the water. Jackie Dunn. Jackie Dunn, yeah. the one where there's three three drops of water coming off. Like that was amazing. It was just butter glass pipe. You know what I mean? Um, who else? There's so many. Um, Sonny Miller, obviously. And then Ted Grambo was always shooting amazing stuff. You know what I mean? And it's not always action. It could be landscapes, and it usually lineups are the things that get me, where it's just this dreamy Indo lineup where you're like, fuck, I want to be there. Or I want to go there one day. That kind of stuff, like, sticks with me, you know what I mean? Um, all those Grambo search ads. Yeah, all that stuff. Just like... Yeah, I love that. Me too. I love so that. Um, then the current day stuff of, like, my era or whatever would be Eichner, Tom Carey. Um, fuck. Nate Lawrence. Chachi, you know, he's, he's for sure one of the best right now. Gnarly. He's fucking gnarly. He's an animal. Um, stills or video or both? It's like, stills as far as stills go, like, that's a pretty good list. There's a lot more. Tim Jones, Mad Dog. Uh, who else? There's so many. Endless. Yeah. And you've got to like travel with a lot of them. Yeah. Them. Brian Beelman. Love. Love Brian Beelman. Top, top. Right underneath you. <laughs> like, and Beelman is like fucking man. And, and it's not just his photography, he's just as a human. And Clark Little, fucking legend, dude. It's like some of the images that guy's produced are just like you can just stare at them for hours. You're like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? And when I saw his first image, I was like, what the fuck? Like, we all do that. Get the inside out barrel shot. Like, who hasn't gotten that? You know what I mean? And then he went on to perfect it and get the best palm trees and sunrises and flash and fucking this and that and like... He's just perfected into this crazy art form that's just undeniably bitching for everyone in the world. There's no one that doesn't like that, or at least no one I've ever met. It's like, I have, I have no people that are jealous, but anybody that tells you that they don't like Clark Little's best photo is lying. They don't like gallery work. If they don't like that, so that's what that is. That's just like, that transcends. Yeah. That's the highest level of photography in my book. It was unbelievable watching him this winter. Gallery work is, is the highest level. Yeah. In my book. Yeah. The most prestigious. But there was a barber quote, I don't know if you ever heard it before. Barber? Yeah. But he said, um, I think I might have actually heard him say this myself. He goes, oh, okay. Bring your best 10 slides. Let's all bring our best 10 slides and put them on the, on the light table. Then we'll talk. Yeah. He goes, that's, that's your value as a surf photographer, your 10 best slides. It's like nothing else matters. Because a lot of other people in our area, a lot of photographers, they like to talk a lot of smack about a lot of other peripheral stuff, right? Yeah. And they would all kind of have these different 
like wars with each other and the bracelets and all that shit. Yeah. I was never a part of any of that. I was friends with every single surfer from every one of their crews. Yeah. And tried to get Barbara to shoot with us. I tried to get all the other photographers to shoot with me. Yeah. Vern, Ron, any of them. The grumpy, super lazy ones, I tried to get them to come, you know, and it was like, they weren't into it. Because they wanted division. You know, they wanted like their own. They were indeed. living in fear. Anybody that lives in fear of anything, the worst of you comes out. That's all there is. So they were afraid that they were going to lose because you were going to get something better or you were going to get there, whatever it is, you know what I mean? And it's like, that's not, that's nature. Yeah. But that Barbara quote, genius. I fucking love. Yeah. And I always have. And I've even had to square it to a couple people before to kind of bring them back to reality. Yeah. You know, and um, we were really blessed to learn from the best of the best. Yeah. You know, and then we didn't go to Brooks. We didn't have any fancy fucking like photography like schooling. Yeah. So what is, is it like for you when a young photographer asks you for advice now? Man, it's, uh, when somebody asks me for advice, it's usually more about work ethic or zest for life than it is about photography, but I will give them photography pointers too. I give a lot of, like I get hit up all the time in Santa Cruz by these little groms that are all psyched and they'll send me their photos and I'm like, wow, <laughs> you know what I mean? The, it's like, is this a photo of like some foamy barrel or what? Like, I can't even, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then throughout the time, they get better and better. And it's like, well, like, then they'll send me one and you can see the lighthouse out, out the end of the barrel. And it's like, perfect. And I'm like, whoa, like, this is working. This kid's getting good. You know what I mean? They all shoot it. And, but I'll talk to them. I'll be like, hey, it looks like you're shooting like when it's really cloudy and at brown water and it's, like, you might want to wait for a blue day when the sun's setting and look out the left and fucking you'll get something magic. You know what I mean? You'll see those big fucking Monterey Cypress trees right there and there'll be like reflections of those in the, wa in the wave and you'll get some special shit. Like, this stuff's cool for now. As learning, you're swimming out there and you're learning how to get that thing in the, po in the pocket every time. But like, as far as photography goes, you're going to trip if you shoot the last 10 minutes of light as the sun's going down and you get one of those magic ones, you're gonna, you, you can get an award-winning photo out there. Like you're at the right spot, the wrong time, basically. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but I have no shortage of time for kids. There's a lot of fucking kids like Rafferty, Shane Rafferty's kid, hits me up every day, Taylor Rafferty. Fucking for this advice, what housing, what should I do? Like, what lens should I get? What's the best fins? Da 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 da. da. And now he's gotten pretty good. He's, he's getting pretty good, you know what I mean? And there's a bunch of those kids. There's, it's pretty sick. There's like 10 of them in my region right there where it's like they send me all this stuff on Insta. They'll just direct message me these fucking photos, you know? And. I haven't decided or s seen enough to decide which one's going to be the successful one out of that group. They're all pretty frothing. It's pretty rad that you're also able to work with other guys who have like, you've seen come up through the years, you know, guys like Garen. Yeah. Who, Garen is so freaking rad because the, the whole punk rock side of things of obviously <sighs> it's like been a huge keeps coming up in our conversation yeah. it's such a big part of our life but he's able to like melt those two worlds and give give it I think the shine that that it deserves you know what I mean because he's such a punker himself yeah oh yeah punk for life for right life. there and so um, you still get to hang out with Garen? all the time yeah, we hang out all the time, dude. He golfs. He's, you know, he skates. We went to Hawaii this winter, and, and we spent 
24 days together living in a fucking little cement block in Sunset Beach at Buddy Surratt's house. You know what I mean? And, uh, and it was all day, every day. That's what we did. We, we went, surfed, skated, and fucking and shot pipe and whatever. And we went to the other side and, and shot this golf course, did some drone stuff over there, and then we skated the, the Blue Bulls on the way back in Kapolei. And, and it was the most amazing trip because then Hasoy and Omar came over and we were hanging with them and Nathan. And so we were like, it was rad because we're all older now and, and we're all surf skaters, all of them. You know, Omar surfs all the time. And so it's like such a sick fucking crew because like what we were talking about before, it's like we love shooting. They love shooting with us, but we don't really need it's there's no pressure anymore. You know what I mean? Like when I was working for Vans, I had to produce a certain amount of shit every winter over there. And now I don't have to. But they'll still use my stuff, you know what I mean? But it's like I don't have to. And it's almost better, you know what I mean? Because if they do use your stuff, you're going to make more money than your retainer anyways. You know what I mean? So, so Nathan, you, you guys started like, God, so early and often. And leading up to like, what, of course, I've always wanted to ask you about is how did the bomb drop off blacks come about? Mm. So there is a era that started about 25 years ago where me and Nathan started skating together. Like I met him way before that down south, but we never really like started hanging out until he came up to Santa Cruz this one time and he was like, fuck Nelly, I love it here. There's wedges everywhere. And he's like, he'd call me and he'd be like, is there any wedges? Tell me, is there any wedges at it's or fucking blacks or where's the wedges? You know what I mean? He was like so fucking funny. He was just such a character. And uh, this one time he came up, and I think he was staying with me, and he was like, he's like, I'm going to bomb drop off blacks. And I'm like, ha! I just laughed. I'm like, you're tripping, dude. <laughs> you know how big that cliff is? You know what I mean? He's like, oh, yeah, I fucking surf up there a lot. I know how big it is. And I'm like, I was just laughing. So the very first one, I walked up, and he was already paddling out, and I see him climbing up the backside of it. And I was just barely putting my lens on my camera, and he's already up there. And I like was looking, to, you know, just make sure your autofocus is working, you know what I mean? And he just fucking runs up and just goes, Pah. and I'm like, you fucking, you know what I mean? And it was like, barely got it. And he broke his board in half. And it's like, thank God, that was the very first one. So I, I was so blown away, I didn't even know what to think. It was like 25 feet bomb drop onto this little teeny wedge. It was like this big. And it was low tide, and it was like, like, what are you thinking, dude? You could just snapped your fucking leg in half, you know what I mean? But he was, what do we call him? I, I can't even remember what his nickname was, but, you know, the indestructible man, basically, you know? And for a long time, he was. He was, you know, until he broke his leg at pipe. But, like... How much of an equal, is equal part leg strength and technique? Because anyone who looks at that, you're like, you just break all your legs and ankles in one go. It all, de from what he described to me, it, it, it depended on how you landed in the transition. That's why that one was the gnarliest, the first one. A, because at high tide, the drop's probably only like 17 feet, 18 feet, you know, when the wedge is there and you're landing on the transition. This was low tide. And there was no transition. And he flew all the way to the flats and landed. Basically, it would be like bomb dropping onto flat cement. With Nathan. Nate, me and Nathan were two peas in a pod because we loved the exact same things. We both smoked ciggies. We loved fucking skating. Didn't matter if it was pools or ditches or ramps. You know, and that was the era of the consolidated ramp. And we would go down there, I had the key, and we'd session for hours and learn. You know what I mean? And it was like, he drove me to skate better for sure. We shot photos of each other 
with my fish eye, you know what I mean? And he'd shoot, he'd be like, fuck, do one of those backside bonuses. And he'd be like, you know, and I'd be like, do a tail grab, big tail grab, backside tail grab, you know what I mean? And we'd get, and it was so fun. It was like, he was one of the only surfers. Like I remember when I went to France with him and we went to Hossiger and Taylor Knox walked up and he was talking to us and he's like, it's like, Nathan, do you know Nelly? He was like, Nathan's like, you mean fucking Dave Nelson, like one of the best skaters in Santa Cruz? Fuck yeah, I do. Like, he didn't want to introduce me as a photographer. He was like, anything but that. It was like, yeah. Anyway, it was awesome. Oh, yeah. Because it was like, He's- like Knox only knew me as a, as a surf photographer. He probably didn't even know I skated. You know what I mean? And so Nathan, like... To get respect from the Fletchers, it's not easy, and it's for a completely different reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was awesome. Anyways. So anyway, me and Nathan were two peas in a pod, and we spent a lot of time together. Like, I'd, I'd drive down there. We'd go to fucking Strands or wherever and shoot, and we'd skate. And we'd go to Vans and get shit and fucking hilarious missions with him. You know what I mean? He was, what, like, Mr., like... Funniest unmanageability ever, you know. I mean, he he couldn't handle a cell phone, dude. It was like, first of all, he didn't run, he didn't have the patience to learn how to work it or put a fucking phone list together. He would just remember people's numbers, you know. I mean, and 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 he didn't, he didn't never put names of people in the phone. And then at one point, he just was like over it and he just like threw the phone away. He's like, fuck this thing, you know what I mean? And so for five months, people would call me, they'd be like, have you seen Nathan? Like, where's Nathan Nelly? You know what I mean? And, like, they'd be calling my phone to find him, the manager of, of Vance or the manager of Oakley or the magazines or his parents. Dibby would call me and she'd be like, oh, have you seen Nathan? And whoever, Rufo would call me and be like, is Nate with you? You know what I mean? It was like, because nobody could get a hold of him. So finally I took him to, I'm like, dude, it's time, Nathan, to, like, get back. got to get another phone. So I took him to the store in, in Newport, and we got him a phone. It was a flip phone. He, he didn't want anything to do with a smartphone, you know what I mean? He was like, fuck that. And so we got him this flip phone, and like, I swear the next day he lost it. He left it at fucking um, <laughs> on base at, you know, what's that place called? What's the base called? In Oahu? No, the base in... Um, Oh my God, dude! No, no, no! Just north of uh, County Line. Oh, Magoo. Point Magoo. Yeah. yeah, he left it there. The next day, so we had to go get him a new phone the next day. You know what I mean? Because it was like this was the time where like everybody was trying to get a hold of him. He had important shit coming up, big stuff, and and I, you know. It's not like I was holding his hand, but I was like definitely directing him and like, dude, this stuff's important, bro. And it wasn't important for me. It was important for him. And I just knew that he, you know, he needed a little bit of fatherly direction at that point. You know what I mean? And it was, it was, anyway, it was awesome because he appreciated it at the same time that he resented it. You know what I mean? It was pretty rad. I took a lot away from that because I hate cell phones, but they're necessary. Totally. But there was that transition period where you could like pull up without one. Yeah. That's when you're talking about now it's a little bit different. But, like, I mean, the- he was the only one I knew that could pull up without one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like on the level of like shooting with people, there's so many different aspects and factors. You know, there's personalities, there's, there's like, <laughs> compatibility, this and that. But for what we do as like water photographers, like the nuts and bolts of somebody who, let's just take barrel photos out of this conversation, okay? Yeah. Like shooting maneuvers from the water with a wide angle. You kind of have this, you look at the wave, you're with the surfer, you have this idea in your mind of this photo that you want to get with this guy. It's kind of a skate influenced photo. You're like, look, I've got this idea for this photo. If you could take off here, you know, pump all the way to where I am, I'm going to give you some room to get some speed. 
And once you're able to pump, like I kind of have this in mind, like maybe this might come together. You yeah. Know what I mean? Yeah. And then there's certain surfers, and you can go out there and you can do that. You can choreograph those kind of photos with. Yeah. And then there's others that, no way, they can't even. There's certain surfers, pro surfers, amazing surfers, they can't shoot with a water photographer. No. They can't choreograph. They don't have that ability. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. I mean, <laughs> so I have a couple years and years of that, you know? You guys that, to this day, I can't believe how good they are at like, getting speed, keeping it to where I am, and then once they get to the camera, like it could change in a half a second, their muscle twitch, whatever, and they can fling fins any fucking day of the week. Yeah. Get the speed. Get the speed and get to you, and then when they get to you, do everything fucking perfect. Like on, on that end of the spectrum, like who are the guys that you shot with that, and, and like you had a couple like shoots with them, and you're like, hey, you know what, guy? Like if we buckle down, we can do magic. Yeah. And you tell them, you're like, dude, not everyone can do that. No. Like that was fucking sick. I want to shoot with you, man. Because of that connection in the water, the, the physical, like sporting, at the athletic aspect of it yeah who are some of the best like just most impressive to you and then of course obviously you guys were able to get some of the best work of your career i imagine <clears throat> well i mean it, there's so many aspects to that question but um matt rockhold obviously was the king because he would study the fucking photos afterwards it was like the next day when you're at bay photo lab getting the stuff he was there with you every time looking at it be like oh that's how Wanna come listen, Hank? Are we are we keeping you from your nap? Are you, huh? you want a nap or I'm gonna take a piss and lay down, but you guys can continue. Okay. Dude, can I have one of your snacks? Yeah. You got the rattus bag over there. <laughs> <laughs> They're just so eyeing it. Totally. Yeah. Trader Joe's is no joke, bro. Uh yeah, so Rocky was the best because a, he would listen to every word. And he, as you know, when you're doing water photography maneuvers, it's a kind of a 50-50 relationship between the photographer and the surfer. It's not like you can just surf the wave and hope for the best. It doesn't work like that. And you have zero chance. Not even .01%. It's zero chance of getting a good shot when you're shooting wide angle and fisheye. <clears throat> um, Why? What's involved? Like you said, it's like a collaboration, you know what I mean? Or, or whatever word you used. What was it again? Chore choreography. Choreogra oh, yeah, the choreography, yeah. So you have to, like, almost draw it in the sand or something where it's like, I'm here, you're here, this is where I want to be. You don't want to be behind the wave because there's usually, it's just, you're just going to get a bunch of spray, you know what I mean? You want to be at an angle, either looking down the lip line or underneath. And realistically, underneath doesn't really look good with airs or that stuff either. It's got to be when you, he's passing you or over you or past you where you're underneath. And that's the best angle when he's past you, like your rat cover or my Hoyer cover. That's the angle, you know what I mean? And, and um, it's such a broad question when you're talking about worldwide who Rat Boy was really good at it. Barney was really good at it, you know what I mean, at working with you and doing what you guys had talked about or I had talked about with them on an international level there were so many guys you know and Jordy was really good you know he'd be like he's he's his board control is amazing where he it was like anything you asked him to do he could do it like in the next wave you know what I mean just tail blot. You're like, oh, just don't throw as much spray. Just kind of flick it. You know what I mean? Flick it into a lip slide. And he'd be like, next wave, perfect, like, lip slide right into you. You know what I mean? Where you're, like, pulling the camera back, but there's no spray so that he doesn't hit you. And you're like, oh, my, okay, we don't need to do that again because we just nailed it, you know? You know? Taj Burrow was amazing at it. You know what I mean? Where he'd go suit Rockies with him and he would just do the same, like, the same pump like a high line pump straight into you where he kept all his speed and didn't like, he didn't bottom turn and then tr do a snap and then try to regain speed and footing. It was just the same thing every time, one pump and then just bottom turn straight into you. Um, 
Nathan was good at it. We got a couple crazy ones over the years where it was like, this is what I want to do. Uh, you know, we got that, I don't know if you remember the underneath one we got where he punted over me. Uh, so that was all us talking about that before that. So that was Scott's speech break, dude. That was impossible, <laughs> impossible to recreate. You know what I mean? It was pure luck, but, but that was all from talking about it before the session what I wanted to get, you know? That's Fuck, I mean, there's so many guys, you know? That's a whole different style of photography than, like, just going out there and getting something as it goes by. You, like, create it in your mind first. But yeah, especially in waves that are moving and everyone's different from the one that came in before it, you know what I mean? Even people look at, like, Sewer Peak and they're like, oh, my God, it's like shooting ducks in a barrel out there. I'm like, actually, it's... It's not at all, dude. That's really moving around. It's like a, it's like a football field out there. World like it looks like it's breaking in the same spot, but it is not at all. Even Stockton isn't. You know, people think it's just like sit on fucking Harperland Bowl and like bang, bang, bang. It's, it's not that easy. This one mushes out, and then that one shifts way in there, and then the next one's a barrel outside. And by the time the you know, what I mean, shooting maneuvers at Stockton's a nightmare, actually. For at least it has been for me, and the lane. How was shooting the waters with John John? Uh, amazing. You know, there was speed and board control, just next level of everything. You know, probably my best, funnest time with him was in the Mentoize, where it was like, because that was that when he was at his peak of his, in his prime already, and he was doing these massive massive flips and punts and, and alley-oops, like crazy, like the stuff we always thought was possible from skateboarding, he was doing now. And nobody's ever done that, you know what I mean? Like watching Hasoy or Sergi Ventura or, or... Tim Ward, animation, Peabody. The yeah, show. exactly. Like that kind of stuff that you never see. All of a sudden, he was making it a reality. And we were, like, I was out there and it was the Gadaskis brothers and John John, Wade Goodall, Nathan, and John John. And, and it was just like, like everyone was just watching. It was so gnarly. Like those guys weren't even, they, were, they just weren't even like, they were just blown away. It was the John John show. And we were at this weird right that was just the big kicker every time, you know. It wasn't even a good way. It's not like you'd ever go out there and try to get barreled but it was like the wave had size and it had push and it had a crumble kicker and he was just doing these fucking gigantic fucking airs dude and and sticking them and after I got so many from the dinghy I'm like I'm gonna go fucking swim that dude and try to get some of the shit and we dude we got nailed a couple of just ridiculous ones where you're like what the hell like you know and a, a few of them were a few of them were like that looks like a flyaway, you know what I mean? But it's not. But he's so upside down that it looks like a flyaway. And it's, it's one of those things that you're very familiar with where it's, if you don't have the sequence, it's just throw it in the garbage can because it looks like he's flying off his board, you know what I mean? But he's not, you know? Whereas before, if you had a guy and his butt's under his board, you're like, garbage, you know what I mean? And so with the mags, they'd be like, dude, that guy's, that's not an air. You know what I mean? Tell us about that trip to him, with him, or that one particular session in particular at P-Pass. Mm. So it was, that was the most awesome story because fucking, I had just come back from P-Pass. I went with Dusty and Gavin and Taj and Geiselman to P-Pass and, and we just murdered it. It was like the sick as well it was like six to eight feet ten feet on the biggest day swam my ass off like for like a week straight and came back it's probably one of the gnarliest trips I've ever been on actually and uh, I was exhausted flew home next day John John calls I'm like what the fuck John John's calling you it's not like he called me all the time you know and I pick it up, and what's up, John? And he's like, he's like, dude, you see that swell going to Pee Pass? You fucking kidding me? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and he's like, dude, there's like a 60-foot west swell going out of the Philippines and this and that. Like, it's going to be the biggest Pee Pass ever. 
we're leaving today. If you can leave tonight out of San Francisco, we can meet in Guam and we'll fly together over to, over to Ponape and, and, and then it'll be on, you know what I mean? He's all, can you call Mitch and see if we can, you know what I mean? And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'm like tripping because I literally just got home. My, my duffel bag hadn't even been unpacked yet. And, and so I, I call Mitch. He's like, fuck yeah, dude. John John, you kidding me? I fucking love John John. And, and um, so the next thing I knew, I flew out back out there. And so we were waiting for the swell. And it was the tidal equinox. It was like the lowest tide of the year. And it was, it's way too low for pee pass, you know what I mean? So we rolled out there and we're like, holy fuck, because the whole ocean's going like this. Like, but it was too low. And so it was just eating itself. It was like 15 foot eating itself double ups, you know? And so we sat in the channel for a while and they're like, let's go check this other wave. So we went around the island and we went and surfed this other wave. It was shit house. It was too low. So we kicked it in that channel and ate breakfast and then we drove back around and, went, and then it was like the tide had filled in and we pulled up and it was, it was like the gnarliest wave I've ever seen rolled through and it was just like four different lips doubling up and John John launched off the boat with his board before it even, he was like oh, panicking and he just launched off the boat with his board before we even fucking set anchor and was fucking strutting. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like. I can't believe he's not even going to sit and watch it for five minutes before, like, he was that psyched. You know what I mean? And the Gudangs were with me, too, and they were like, fuck that. Like, <laughs> we're going to watch it for a little bit, you know? Because this thing was literally doing the, you know, remember the Shane Dorian swell out there where it was eating itself and there was, like, five different, it was doing that. And John John sat and did, he did the, it was the most amazing surfing I'd ever seen till still to this day where he got like 40 of the craziest barrels known to man in a row without falling once and his little brother Nathan was there Nathan was young <clears throat> and Nathan was even saying to me we were sitting there and I was shooting before I swam and he was like dude I've never seen John surf this good it was fucking insane he was like paddling up the face and it would be like going square and he would whip it mid face and be under the lip as he was standing up and then he would like take off in the barrel on these like 12 footers and just fucking straight into like stand up soul arch fucking way back behind the curtain just was psycho. And he never fell once the whole session. So, and then, so anyway, I came back, I, 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 I was like, fuck, I gotta swim. <laughs> Like, they're going to fucking hate me if I don't swim this in the magazine. You know what I mean? And I wanted to swim, but it was, like, so scary. It was psycho scary. But I knew I had to, or else I would always be mad at myself. So I swam out, and I ended up, like, first hookup was with Nathan, his little brother. We got this crazy stand-up barrel, and then, like, shortly after that, I got one of Tanner huge one like that was the one I thought that was the I'm like oh I got the shot dude that's the cover for sure huge one backside no grab just fucking standing there massive barrel and then and then I got one of John but it was tiny tiny was like still big but like it wasn't like what John was doing that whole day and then uh, and then I got one of Dane and I knew I didn't have one of John and it was like dude it was it was just deadly out there, like huge and scary. Then, after like three hours, I saw this big set coming in and John John was taking off and I like hung back with my fins, you know, waiting, waiting. And the thing just tripled up like right where I was and he just fucking stood up and just put his arms behind his back and just stood all the way by me. And I was like, okay, that was like, 17 shots of perfection you know what I mean like there's no way that we didn't just get the cover and fucking the next wave I like came through the back of that and I see Dane and he's like no he's screaming at the top of his lungs and he's pointing to the channel and and 
I started swimming and I fucking made it under the first one and I came through and I was just like the whole channel had turned into a wave. It was literally three and a half hours since I swam out there. I was fucking exhausted. And you know, the only one I didn't have an absolutely massive bomb of was John John, which was the one that I knew that they wanted the cover of. I knew it. I had already talked to Cote. He was like, fuck, we need the fucking John cover, you know what I mean? And, uh, and it was ironic because he had gotten a bunch of sick ones that day, but it was so big that it was like, like he'd take off and be bottom turning and pulling in and I'd be like fucking just swimming for my life, you know what I mean? And I wasn't in the spot. And then I'd swim in and then he'd drop in and get barreled and be just getting spit out where I was. And so then I'd swim back out. It was like, we just kept trying to reposition. And it was, I was just, even though I was getting barrel shots of him, I knew we weren't, we hadn't got it. You know what I mean? Uh, and, uh, and then we got that one. And then yeah. that was the biggest irony ever. Cause literally it was like we talked about earlier where you're swimming as hard as you can with your fins and they're cramping because you need to get out. Like if I got sucked over on that one that I hooked up with John, it was like dry reef in there. And so I like swimming that hard and my legs were all fucking tight. And I came out the back and Dane was like, Nelly fucking pointing like, like this. And he was like 50 yards out from me, straight outside pointing like towards the channel. And I was like, oh fuck. Made it through the first one, came up the second one. I was like, I just stopped swimming. The whole ocean was like black and it was coming out of the channel because it was so west. You want like northwest at Pea Pass, you don't really want straight west because it's just, it's almost like Chopes where it's like a west one is just a west one. There is no like, it's not like you can take off back there and backdoor the west bowl. Anyway, <laughs> I, I knew I was toast. I stopped swimming and I'm like, okay, protect your housing. Because I just knew, I, I knew that we just took, got the most magic sequence ever. And I swam down to the bottom. I grabbed the fucking reef. And it was like a 12-footer just doubling up as hard as a double up can double up. You know what I mean? It was like a huge backdoor wave. Like massive one, you know, where it doubles up and there's just that like power behind it. I grabbed the reef and it just ripped me like I've never been ripped and just drugged me on the bottom for like... 150 yards underwater. It was just pinballing off the reef. And <clears throat> I came up choking purple and I fucking swam back out to the boat. And they're like, you okay? That was fucking gnarly. That was, you know, it was like the biggest set of the day that I was in the worst spot you could possibly be on. And I had been out there for three and a half hours. So I was exhausted, dude. And I got back to the boat and I was like, just take my housing. <laughs> I was just, I couldn't even get myself up on the boat. I was so fucking taxed. But anyway, to go back to that question, which was, how was that P-Pass trip with John? It was the gnarliest display of surfing I've ever seen to this day, by far. Like, the uncanny, freakishly talented. You remember how Aunt Nelly used to paddle up the face and do those takeoffs where he'd fly? Like, he was doing that, but, like, times 10 on, like, 15-footers at P-Pass and just taking off inside the barrel, like, where it was psycho shit. Where, and it, it was the introduction of where they were really starting to knife it on short boards, where it was, you know, anybody in normal fucking surfer back in the day would have been riding, like, a 7.6, you know what I mean? He was riding like a 5.11 or a 6.2 or something and literally knifing it under these things. And even Nathan said, that was the best I've ever seen John surf. And it was like, oh my God, I got to document that and see it with my own eyes. And it was just such a special, special, special experience. You know what I mean? And it was like, and it was so awesome because John literally surfed all fucking day long until night. And then we went in and his eyes were like, puffy and he, and he had like black almost black eyes because they were so fucking sunburned and he like passed out on his plate of fucking sashimi dude we had this big plate of sashimi and he passed out at the table and he was just fucking like it was insane it was just dream trip and it was funny because I was so exhausted from the trip before I was like even if it wouldn't have been John I wouldn't have gone 
because I was that taxed from the trip before, you know what I mean? And then Dusty and Gavin and, and Taj and those guys are like, oh. as soon as they heard I went back with John, they knew, they knew their, their odds of getting a cover were done, you know what I mean? Because John is John. And they, knew, they saw that swell also. And it was like, okay. This. So then I got on my computer while we were in Ponape and I emailed some samples to Cote. And he was announcing at the Pipe Masters. And John was going, not the Pipe Masters, the, the backdoor shootout. And, or maybe it was the Vulcan Pipe Pro. Whichever one, it was one of those ones. And, and John was barely going to make it back for his heat because it was, it was all the trials. And John didn't need to surf the trials, right? And so then Cote was like on the announcement. He's like, it's the first time I've ever done this, but I'm going to let you all know. We just got the new cover shots via internet sent over from Ponape from Mr. Dave Nelson. <laughs> it was like awesome. You know, you know, I got to listen to all that shit later. And uh, it was fucking just a mess magic trip, dude. He seems so understated, like just like unaffected by his freakish like performances and talent and whatnot. You guys must have talked about that session afterwards, like how how was his demeanor about all that? Well Or was it like it was just like nothing or was he putting No no it was not nothing. It was something. Psyched. Yeah. So we studied the photos that day and that night. We've had some uh, conversations about that set particular session since. Just actually this last winter, because I brought him my book, and that photo from that wave is in it. It's a two-page spread, and it was like, you know, we talked about that memory. Um, I kind of browned out, like, what's the... Like his... Oh, his demeanor. He's yeah. the most humble dude ever. And he's... It's interesting because, like Nathan, he doesn't really like the f attention on him at all times. You know what I mean? He, or, or a lot. He doesn't, he doesn't like that. He likes surfing. He loves skateboarding. He loves surfing. He loves sailing. He loves riding his little mini bike to the fucking skate park. He's kind of a loner, John John. And, to, you know, it's not like he doesn't have a million friends, because he does. He's, he's got this crew that he's very stuck with, Eli Olson and, and Co. Rothman, and they're, like, super tight, this crew. But he's also a loner. He likes to go mountain bike by himself and train and hike. And he hangs out with his mom. He loves, to, he loves his brothers. But he's fucking, he's not one of those like fame hungry or world title hungry got kids. He doesn't care about that shit. He doesn't even use a phone a lot of the times, you know I mean? He just doesn't, like you can't just call John John. He doesn't, he doesn't carry his phone ever. Do you think he wants to be like the best or doesn't care about that at all? Because he did. He did when he was when he was in those world title hunts for sure. He was fucking hungry, you know what I mean. But it's not Slater hungry, where it was like anything goes to win. Yeah. This was more like uh, I want to prove to myself that I can be the world's fucking. The, I can win the world title, and I know that he was stoked when he won the fucking surfer pole. Because I was there, and fucking he was stoked. But it wasn't like. Some people are like, oh my God, I'm the most popular surfer in the world. Like, that was their goal. Like, he didn't give a fuck as far as that goes. But he was stoked when he won. Now, who wouldn't be? You know what I mean? Of course. But it wasn't, like, ever a goal of his to win that. He, he made funny jokes. It was the first, you know, he's, he's such a character. He made funny jokes about it. Like, with Slater there, he's like, oh, I got you, fucker. You know, I never thought I was going to get you. You know what I mean? And, like calling him out and he was calling him dad and shit so I got you dad <laughs> like it was so good dude he's, it's pretty funny Ed their Ed relationship's hilarious he doesn't care he doesn't care there's some fucking awesome characters in the surf world right now and most of them are in Hawaii you know what I mean like Mason Ho 
when he won his fucking surfer polo award, dude, that was the funniest shit I've ever seen in my life. Did you ever see that? He gets up there, he won best edit or best video of the year. And him and Cheeseburger get up there, and Cheeseburger's hammered. Mason's not hammered, but he's just Mason. And he's like, ah, oh, I see. See, he's like, buy the cocoa. Like, where's my fucking coconut water? It's all Etnies. You didn't return my call. What's up? Like, like <laughs> all the shit, like calling people out and like, like, just the funniest shit ever, you know. So how about like early Grom trip? Like how old was John when you guys first shoot? Not so that the funnest. I was actually planning on talking about that. Um, I went on a trip with Ozzy Wright and Bruce Irons and Randy Bonds down to Cabo. And we roll we rock up at a <clears throat> that little right down there called Shipwrecks. Shipwrecks. And and we roll down to the beach and Bruce is like, Is that fucking John John? There's no one out except this one little white toehead kid. And he's, he takes off on this wave, and he's, the wave's like three feet, you know what I mean? And he's just weaving down the line and fucking doing lippers. And I'm just like, holy fuck, like, who is this kid? Like, mind-blowing, six-year-old, paddling into his own wave, you know what I mean? It was like, and ripping the shit out of all the way through to the sand. And he comes running up, what's up, Bruce? And like, he's just fucking, like... This little, like, freckled out, white hair, long hair. I'm like, oh, my God, this is the cutest kid I've ever seen in my life. Like, ever. And he's got this super high voice, and he was just like, hey, Ozzy! Fucking, like, you know, hugging Bruce and shit. I'm like, oh, my God, I got to fucking figure out who this kid is, because this kid is fucking rad. And so then we met, and I met his mom, and I met Nathan. Ivan wasn't born yet. And... Uh, and turned out he rode for O'Neill, and the next winter, O'Neill had sent me to Oahu to go shoot, and John was like part of that campaign already. They're like fucking, you know, Nathan wasn't part of it yet, but John was, and it was just like, we, he was already ripping at skating, like ripping. Seven years old, All, huge ollies, like you name it, like crazy, and so. Just like anybody that you and I adore, he's a surf skater, you know what I mean? And so we built our relationship right there, and he it was rad. He like went back, he's like, Mom, Nelly fucking rips his skating, you know what I mean? It was like, it was awesome, you know? And so we just, and his mom skates, Ivan fucking rips. But to go back to your question, like that's that was the first time I met John, and then from then on, it was like they'd send him to Santa Cruz to shoot with me. He'd stay at my house. We'd fucking, you know, I'd take him over to Natural Bridges. We'd go pack closeouts at Garapata. We just had a lot of fun, and and we'd skate skate parks on the way home. We'd just skate pools, and I, I took him to Buena, and you know, what I mean, it was like rad to watch this kid. What did he do at Buena? He grind it? No, he was too young. Yeah. Yeah. It was just corner carving. Sick. You know? Yeah. Those weren't easy corners to carve. No. But he was way beyond his like all the way back to like one of my last trips that I ever did with him was to Scotland. And I hadn't been on a trip with him in like over a year. And we went there and there's ramps everywhere. And we fucking went and skated and I was like, holy fuck, dude, he just like <laughs> had gotten like 20 steps better at skating like he was just doing smith grinds all the way across backside smiths all the way across like huge fucking ollies ollie melon grabs like five feet out like <gasps> boned out like crazy and then we went and skated this other park and there was this other ramp with a huge hip and he was just doing these drifting ollie tail grabs over the hip like <gasps> all you know like so high that they were like slow motion anyway over the years, I got to see a lot of his progression and shoot a lot of different places with him. We went to Costa Rica and Puerto Escondido and Scotland and Indo and Santa Cruz and Mexico, Puerto Escondido. Like, it was crazy to watch his progression and also to see like 
what happened in the surf world because it was we shot together for at least 10 years before we got a cover and they were like and i had like crazy photos of him like crazy crazy and they're like we don't want to fucking spoil him dude we don't want to jade him he's special you know what i mean we're not gonna fucking david eggers out john john so let's hold back we'll run spreads and shit and we'll you know we'll run trips that you know stories and shit but like and so finally when we got that cover from p pass that was our first cover after from six years old until 18 or whatever he was then that was 12 years and so he wrote when he signed my cover he wrote it's about time nelly and then fucking signed it you know what i mean because it was like that's how long we waited for that you know but he was almost kind of like a childhood novelty in his early years like as far as like he was so good for how young he was that that wasn't you wouldn't put like a novelty on the cover back then and it was the cool guy or whatever which says a lot to how for him to have to transcend all that yeah and then he became obviously the coolest thing since sliced bread yeah but before all that it was like like for him to not have gotten the cover until then says a lot like you said about surf industry or whatever you want to call it I think that they're yeah I mean a lot of people, they're like, oh, John Styles gotten weird and gangly. I'm like, you guys are fucking tripping, dude. He's the best surfer in the world. And they're like, really? Like, I'm not seeing it. Fucking this, not and sure enough. You know what I mean? It was like, a lot of people, they were like, they thought he had lost his thing because he had grown so fast. I was hearing all kinds of shit, you know, from the photo editors, too. They're like, yeah, let's see what happens, you know. And I'm like, you guys are fucking tripping, bro. He's doing the biggest airs, like, known to man. Like, you guys aren't, you know. It's incredible he was able to to form that into a contest, a winning contest repertoire. It is. It's really weird because, in my opinion, his, his barrel riding is, like, second to none. Other than Kelly, maybe. You know what I mean? No one else compares. His airs best in the world by far even better than Dane Reynolds like better than anyone and bigger than anyone his turns I wouldn't say that about not that his turns aren't sick as fuck but it's not like his turns are the best in the world you know but he was able to tone down his turns and make them stylish and He, ex he, he excels at certain spots, you know what I mean? It's like fucking Big Holly Eva, dude. No one can touch John John at Big Holly Eva. When you see him in a contest, you can tell that he's fulfilling the criteria. Yeah. He's not doing his surfing. No, and it's almost more dangerous for him. Like, that, like when he hurt his ankle on that one, it was like he didn't try to go for a big punt. He tried to go for a little teeny 360 flicky air, and, that, and that's why he folded his ankle. Exactly. If he would have done his normal fucking humongous punt, he would have probably landed clean and fucking rode out of it, you know? It's so incredible to me how, like, surfing has come around to where, like, airs are part of the criteria. So if you grew up surfing and skateboarding, you had just a huge advantage once the criteria changed and airs were included. Yeah. You had that technique, you know, you had that front foot. Ollie thing, you know, just built in, and it's hard to learn that as an adult. You know, if you did that as a kid, and then all the way through. <laughs> Plus, as you know, as a, as a as a skater, or and a surfer, there's two different airs you can do on a on a wave. You know, I mean, you can do like right when the wave's steep enough, almost like it's not really a bunny hop because it's already steep enough. It's like riding off a almost a vert bowl and doing an air. Or there's the like off the lip coping air. Exactly. And only a skater knows the difference between that, you know, what I mean? where it's like, or, or they have the advantage of knowing that, where it's like, oh, the wave's steep enough, I'm fucking, I can punt already. And other guys are waiting for the coping. That's their only chance. It's like somebody who can't, doesn't know how to ollie, you know? Yeah. And maybe they can early grab, or maybe they can, you know, like, 
double grab or some shit, but yeah. it's the same as, like once you got an ollie, that's the same in surf. Yeah. But it's so rad that that rose to the top and took out everybody when John really wanted it and he fucking won the title, but for me, I love to think about the best surf skaters of all time that they got the like the highest level of surfing and the highest level of skateboarding of one person ever and for me i'm really stoked i had a chance to shoot with him a couple times and i know you got to shoot with him a lot but tell me about kalani david kalani david he's an amazing when I first started hanging out with him, he was tiny. So he came to sit, the very first time I got to surf with him, they sent him to Santa Cruz to sh come shoot, and he was riding for Santa Cruz, right? And so I met him at NHS. We got him some gear. He set up a brand new skate, which is always weird, right? At least it would be for me, because the trucks are weird or whatever. We took him down to the skate park, and I was just like, holy shit. The kid was like 10 years old, maybe. And he was doing the biggest airs you could ever imagine out of these, all these bowls that he'd never skated. And he was doing ollie to grinds and fucking inverts and trying 540s and shit. I was like, what the fuck? Like, who is this kid? And then we took him surfing and it was me and Archie and Kalani David went up to Anya. And he was just annihilating, like big old lip slides and fucking airs and and super wave knowledge too like taking off behind it and digging his arm in and backdooring the barrel and coming out and trying airs you know what I mean and like Archie was like holy shit like this kid's gnarly you know I mean Archie already knew him from off the wall and the whatever on the North Shore or from, from him, but he didn't had never seen him surf like this you know what I mean he'd, he'd obviously improved since the year before when Archie was over there and uh so anyway, that was my introduction to him, and then we became friends over the years, and I'd go over to the North Shore and shoot with him, and, and he took me to his ramp one time, and it was like, which was mind-blowing, because that was a different level. All of a sudden, it was like, it was like watching fucking Lincoln Ueda or something, you know? It was just massive fucking eight-foot stale fishes and frontside crazy, like, hanging frontside inverts, and just, he can, he's gnarly. So the fact that he can surf that well and skate that well is pretty impressive, you know what I mean? As far as being the best in the world, that's a hard one because it's like, I like, first of all, I have a passion for anyone that loves to surf and skate, you know what I mean? All our friends, there's a bunch of them. And then, and then your favorites. But he, he has to be up there in the top three. There's no doubt. With Nathan, Christian, and then and then all the rest of our favorites, you know what I mean? How about the guy who was probably the last person to make the finals of a skate contest of the top 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 pro yeah. level? And then same weekend make the finals of a surf contest. Is that Nathan? No. Nathan never did that. Nathan won the one that was in France. No, I'm, I'm not saying a surf skate event. Okay. I'm saying like win Two a, separate. Win an ASP event or make the finals. And then like win a fucking like skate contest, like top level. Was that Kalani? The finals. No. No? Who was it? KR. Ah, there you go. Way back in the day. I was going to bring up buttons, you know what I mean? And like... Bertelman, the fucking, but yeah, Kevin Reed, fucking gnarly. <clears throat> I mean, I know Kevin Reed's history and some of it, not all, not as well as you and Meekster do, you know what I mean? But like, he's definitely top tier of Santa Cruz legends and worldwide legends and one of the inventors of the aerial and yeah, he's amazing. But what was the? Do you remember the first time you saw KR, like surf? 
Did you see him with the river mouth back in those? Yeah. I've seen him surf the four mile, river mouth, harbor mouth. Like, take us into one of those river mouth sessions that you saw him first time. What was he riding? What did he do on the wave? Do you have any distinct memories of KR? From? I think. Because I do. He did a fucking. He did two switch foot straight ollies. Goofy foot? Left. Yeah. Really? Sick ones in a row. <laughs> I was paddling over. Yeah. No joke. Hauling ass at the section. Huge fucking boost. And he did all kinds of shit, but that's one thing that stood out in my mind. I've still never seen anyone do that. Even wow. One. No, that's crazy. I, I wanted to do one like... <laughs> like recently, I, I like a couple days ago, I was like, fuck, I want to do a straight switch all it. Like, I was just like obsessed and I never got around. But, yeah, um, you know who's good at that shit is Columbo. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Columbo he's fucking. Super, yep, he's really good. Yep. I've seen it, for sure. I think the best memory for me, the, those days are really early for me, the 82, 83. I was tiny. I was like, 13, 14 years old or 15 or whatever. I don't even know what I was. But I was always surfing the left, so he was always on the right. So I did see him out there, but I don't, you know, remember. But I did see him surfing four mile and on, you know, actually, where he was punting airs. And it was like fucking some of the first airs that I'd ever seen in the water, if not the first ones, you know what I mean? What was he riding? Do you remember? No. Probably an arrow, I think. Arrow twin fin, maybe. Yeah. Definitely. Wing pin, fucking twin fins, with fucking fins way the fuck up there. Yeah. Crazy channels and you have really narrow boards. And yeah. Just like just bizarre shit. Yeah, he was he was another one of those guys that was like bigger than life to me. You know, what I mean, he had long white blonde hair. He drove a fucking convertible, fucking pimped out, fucking sick car, and he'd fucking surf skate, fucking. Ninja, you know what I mean? And he'd pull up at Buena and fucking pull right up the fucking hill and park his car like pretty much on the coping almost with music blaring and he'd pop out with a beer and be like, fuck yeah, boys, you know, or whatever, and rip the shit out of the pool. Did you ever see that, you know? Of course. Yeah. It was like. One course. And that was like fucking. One course. You know, before to me. Before he served. To me, that was everything I wanted to be. All wrapped up into one, you know what I mean? And that's why I was there in the sticker truck <laughs> skating with Meekster. Yeah, dude, we didn't really understand at that moment in time that we were witnessing in reality one man who would spark what would become the X Games, all of it. Yeah. Because you had skateboarding, you know, it was evolved from surfing. Then you had surfing, started doing skateboarding tricks. Then you had skateboarding going way off into its own fucking realm, snowboard, snowboard tricks that came from from that yeah you know what I mean like like basically what taking a skateboard trick and into another sport that's what Kevin Reed did and so then all of a sudden it's not skateboard it starts with Tony Alva's frontside air basically or George Orton or whoever you know yeah um, fucking the other guy who had the longboards even before those guys JT Jeff Tatum so you have all these guys way back in the day getting airs and whatnot, and KR is skating with them on a peer level, doing the same thing, skateboarding, then invent, brings it to the water, basically. It changed the whole yeah. shape of Santa Cruz surfing forever, for sure, Worldwide. if you look at... So then it was okay snowboarding to come along and do the same thing, and kiteboarding, and fucking any other sport that yeah. comes from what we're talking about, you know what I mean? So that's like, that's really the X Games, extreme sports, 
all the different fucking sports, you know what I mean? Like it's even like if it's gonna be motorcycles, they're like on quarter pipes and shit. It's like still like surf skate oriented. Yeah. If it's an X Games. You know what I mean? They find a way to make it kind of from our world, it all comes from KR. If you like trace it all the way back down. So bit of a tangent that you know, I mean you'd be probably clipped out, but <laughs> uh, pretty sick I mean, what I meant by it changing Santa Cruz not that it didn't change the rest of the world too but it was like if you look back in history after that or during that not only did he change all of us and how we skated but Steve Price and Lansing and fucking those guys were all watching Kevin Reed and yourself everyone right Meekster Everyone. Pete Mel. Yeah. Rat Boy, you know, like Packers, Loya, just, just everything. Yeah. yeah. You know, we got to witness that. We was, were just born into that. Air surfing are part of the deal, you know, way before. Like there was a community somewhere else in the world onto that. You know, there was a few guys here and there that were starting to do it. You know, after KR. Yeah. But what you're talking about, the price of our generation, that was when it became a movement. Yeah. But, so it was pretty rad for, like, they didn't know it, but all the other, like, the rad surf skate guys in the world, all the guys we've been talking about, Nate Fletcher, John John, Kalani David, they got to work with you and whatnot, and probably didn't even, well, Nathan probably did, but those other guys probably didn't realize the heritage that was behind working with a Santa Cruz surf skate photographer, you know, that basically you're a direct bloodline from Kevin Lee, <laughs> you know, and they are, they, they're from the same deal, but it's like the bloodline's way more diluted. Yeah. Because it goes everywhere, you know. And I guarantee Nathan knows everything because yeah. he knows everything about everything. Straight up. That matters. And then he doesn't know anything about, like, what doesn't matter. <laughs> he doesn't give a fuck. But if it, anything has to do with surfing or history, like, Nathan knows, like, fucking every single thing there is to know, especially with stuff that matters like that. You know what I mean? Surfing royalty. Yeah. You know, Marty, Hoffman. But he's different. His family is, like, the... No, he's totally... He's way different than his brother. Yeah. It's like... Because you've got to work with Christian a lot. I have, I have, but um, not as much as Nathan, nowhere near, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I do know the difference. It's like if you ask Kristen, he'd be like, I don't fucking know, you know what I mean? And if you ask Nathan, he's like a fucking encyclopedia. He knows exactly how long Hoffman Fabrics has been around and Marty Hoffman and this and that. And fucking the, you know, his dad did the first fucking air at Pipeline on a jet ski. And this, and he knows everything. And it's not just, it's not selfish where he knows all his family's heritage and history. He knows everything about Hawaii and their history and who their relatives are and where the ancient Hawaiians surfed and what they rode and who invented there and all the East Coasters. He knows everybody. He knows everything about them. Like, it's crazy. Factual information. He is a fucking fact book, which is awesome because you can get educated by that. Like, we spent a lot of time when we went... Do, we did this one road trip up in Seattle in the Straits of Juan de Fuca, and we had a lot of downtime just cruising around in the car looking for spots, and some of the stuff I learned in those drives, and how fucking funny Nathan is, dude. It's some of the best memories I ever had, you know what I mean, as far as, <laughs> as far as, yeah, just talking about surf history. Did you get to hang out with Herbie much? Yeah, a bunch. Herbie's awesome. Like one of the first pool skaters in the world. Yep. I've seen some of the fucking barefoot photos of him on a little Hobie skateboard or something like crazy. Yeah. Going over the light in the 60s and shit. Like, not 70s, you know, like way back. Yeah, metal wheels. Gee, shit. <laughs> He's awesome. 
Yeah, I've spent a bunch of time with Herbie, not only in Hawaii, but, you know, um, everywhere, actually. Down down at Astrodeck and down in San Clemente at the... I went to to the skate park with him and and Grayson when when Grayson was just a teeny teeny kid like this big, and Herbie and just hung out with those two and shot photos. I have some of the fucking earliest photos of Grayson when he was starting to get do airs and stuff, you know. So cool. You've had such an amazing chance to rub shoulders with with so many greats. Of all of your like childhood super legend heroes that you actually got to meet and hang out and be friends with. Who's at the top of that list? God, there's so many, but like uh, the first one that comes to mind is I went to Hawaii in 1985, and I like looked out our hotel room. I was staying in Waikiki, right? Oh, and that's that was the other part of the story. Is it kind of sucked the whole time we were there, and so we saw this monster south swell coming. But my ticket was for like whatever day it was for. I don't remember. It was like June 20th, right? The swell was coming on the 21st. I was like, oh, my God. So I sold my plane ticket to this lady. And she gave me hers. It was back in the day before any of that nightmare stuff happened. So you could do stuff like that, you know. She gave me 200 bucks. Cause she wanted to get on my flight. I went to my flight, and it was overbooked. And so she gave me 200 bucks and her ticket. So I went back to Waikiki, 200 bucks. I was, like, thinking I was rich with 200 bucks, you know what I mean? And I ended up staying with – we had a staggered – week with some of my other friends and so when my friends when the friends I was with left that I was supposed to leave with these friends came in on the same day so I ended up staying in their hotel room and uh, and the next day the swell hit and I ended up surfing fucking huge Publix on like a Ken Bradshaw single fin whatever and when the swell came down I paddled out Kaiser's and who's out there with fucking buttons dude and fucking, I'm like watching, just like, holy shit. And then I got a left, and he was paddling back out, and he was all stoked because I fucking, I don't know what I did, like something. And, and I was paddling back out, and he starts talking to me, and I was like, oh, this is fucking blowing pigeon, you know what I mean? And I was like, oh, my God, like, this is like, my whole body was tingling, dude. I was like, this isn't happening, you know what I mean? We paddle back out, sits right next to me, starts fucking talking to me. Mark Liddell paddles up from the right. He's sitting on the other side of buttons. They're fucking talking. I'm just sitting there, like, listening to every fucking word they said. And then, and then I ended up blowing down with buttons and fucking. It was just like the best day of my life, you know what I mean? And then later on, I I got to know him really well later on. But like at that point in my life, when I was 17 years old, it was like you couldn't have given me any better gift, you know? Boss, wow, that's incredible. It was so cool. And what was cool is that it could have been the opposite. You know what I mean? I could have, like, blown it and dug rail, and he could have been a dick and been like, beat it, fucking Howley. You know what I mean? Who knows? Who knows how it could have been? You know what I mean? But he was cool as shit, and we fucking sat right next to him, and I fucking talked to him, and, you know, it was... That was a heroic... One of the most heroic people I ever met, you know? For me. Do you have any regrets, or do you feel like all the bad experiences have been lessons? I do. I have a couple of regrets. They're probably not what you think they are. One of the biggest regrets that I have, it's like even hard to talk about, but like when I was at Barney's service, not getting up and talking about it, you know what I mean? I should have got up and fucking spoke because... I have a lot to say about him and I know him really well, you know what I mean? And I had a lot of fucking insane experiences with him that, you know, I could have shared with the community at that time. That's a regret. Big one. And that's just from being shy and like insecure in front of big groups of people. I don't like that. I don't like being in front of big groups of people. I don't especially don't like talking in front of big groups of people. And there's been others of those where it's like, it's just, it's not what, you, like I said, it's not what you'd think, you know what I mean? It's like people would think I'd be like, fuck, I regret that I fucking use drugs or whatever. It's like, nah, it's not, it's not about that stuff. It's stuff that really mattered to me that I didn't do. 
which has given me the fire to do shit and not let those magic chances go by you know what I mean try to be more of a yes man and less of a no man and fucking it's it's uh yeah Barney was a guy that for all of his close friends he would teach us he would force us all to learn about ourselves yeah due to his unique perspective not only what he would say to you which would just coming from a completely different perspective <laughs> but in his own actions and abilities on so many different levels you know like what's one of your favorite memories of Barney that trip to Tahiti was hands down the, uh, it was one of the best trips of my life because he was on this crazy manic episode but it was all good energy, insane. Some of the best energy I've ever been around and he was surfing phenomenal. But his humor, I mean, you know, Barney was so off the wall. He never knew what he was gonna say. Half the time he'd have to explain himself because he didn't even know what he was talking about. He was just so out there, but it was like the most that was the period where there was a bunch of years where I like hung out with Barney all the fucking time, you know what I mean? But he was riding for vans. Rat was never wanting to shoot. Flea switched to DVS, so it was Barney, you know what I mean? It was me and Barney everywhere we went, you know? And then Tyler and Russell came on later, but <clears throat> some of the best, I don't know. I mean, that night that he married, <laughs> Tyler and his girl was I've never laughed so hard in my life it was like four hours straight of just fucking dying I was laughing so hard because he was so off the wall and so out of his mind and thinking that everything was normal and he had all the shit written down in these journals that he brought explain what he did uh, so we got done surfing this crazy day at Chopu Barney was on a loopy one. He was ha he's manic depressive, and he was on a manic episode, and it had lasted days. And he proceeded to put on one of the gnarliest shows at Chopu that I've ever seen. Backside, like taking off behind the ball and standing in these massive barrels while Bruce Irons was towing in. Barney was paddling in these crazy waves and fucking making them, and like screaming at the top of his lungs while he was in the barrel. And I was with Tyler Smith, and we were sitting on the dinghy just going, are you, is this really happening? Like, are you kidding me? It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. It was like nothing I had ever expected flying over there with Barney. I bet it was going to happen, you know what I mean? I had no idea that he was that good in those kind of waves. I had seen him charge chokes, I mean Mavs, but I never knew that he was that psycho and big fucking barreling lefts, you know? I, never, I had no clue. And he was screaming, like doing these fucking yodeling in the barrel as these Brazilians were trying to take off on these 10, 12 footers <laughs> and it was echoing and like this was that huge choke you know what I mean and he'd come into the boat and be like did you guys see that one like freaking and just fucking he'd get on the boat and he'd start like doing these chants and all this crazy stuff and then he'd be like now let me get give me a piece of that nicorette and i'm like okay and like give him a piece of nicorette he'd chew it chew it chew it and then he'd start puking over the edge of the boat and he'd be like shit's so good let me get another piece and i'm like are you kidding me like what is this what is going tyler's like dude don't give him another piece like it was so gnarly and then like you know, everyone was out there, Ray Mana and every, all, like Hank and Bruce and all these people. And the, the whole show became about Barney. Everything was focused on Barney because he was fucking ripping. And he was like surfing the, 
some of the best that I've seen him surf ever. And and then he paddled back out and did the same thing again. And then so that night he was on a manic one, you know, and it was that now accentuated by this magic surf session that he had that was like even more manic because he knew that Hank was there, I was there. Raymana was there. All these people were like, fucking dude, that was insane. Bruce was there. So he invited Bruce over and he had this whole thing planned in his mind of how he was going to marry Tyler Smith and his girlfriend. And nobody knew but him, including Tyler and his girlfriend. And so he had written down all these speeches for like best man stuff. And he had these graphs and stuff of where they should stand and where he was going to be. And Hank was going to be the pallbearer. Bruce was going to be the one that, you know, he had it all graphed out and these speeches written for each person. So he tore them out and gave them to each of us. And still Tyler, and they, they didn't even know still. And then we were all holding these pieces of paper. We were like, what the fuck, dude? This is like, this is crazy. And then and, and he calls Tyler and Chelsea out to the outside room. And he's like, Tyler and Chelsea, report. You know how he is report to the commandant's office or whatever he said, like report to the, and so they come out and he's like, we are gathered here today and starts doing the whole thing. Dude, we were fucking, I was literally like, I could not, I was crying. I was laughing so hard. And like Tyler was like, he's like looking at me and then like looking at Barney and he's like, what do, like, what do I do? Like, he's like, okay, well, I guess we're just going to go along with it. And he had made this ring out of this beautiful thing it was actually a beautiful ring for it. And he handed it to Tyler. He's all, here's your wife, your new wife's ring, your bride to be, here's her new ring. You know what I mean? And like he married him and they were getting married like two weeks later in the, in Santa Cruz. So they didn't want to get married, but they were, <laughs> they were married by Barney. And then we all like congratulated them and stuff. And they were like, that was the most awkward, funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. So that was one of my best Barney memories, but there are so many, you know I mean? It was like, there was this era where he was doing these huge flips on waves and everyone wanted it and especially Transworld. And so we were trying to nail that thing, like him actually sticking it, you know, not just doing them because he'd do them over and over huge ones and he would almost pull it, but not right away or he'd, or he would whatever, you know I mean? I, I'm, I'm not even sure what the ratio was, if he pulled two ever or whatever. But we shot thousands of rolls of those things, dude, and it was just like so painful. They're like, just throw it away, dude. If he doesn't stick it, just throw it. I'm like, I'm not throwing that shit away, you kidding me? Like, so I had, to, I had to decide which one of the rolls I was gonna develop. And then there were other ones I'd throw away because it was like, which one did he look like he was stuck and stomped on, you know what I mean? But not planted it, not finished it. But which one he did he was he five feet out upside down planted on his board and then I developed that one for myself so I'd have it and then I'd throw the rest of the rolls away it was so painful that was pretty sick though he was such a fucking as you know you know what I mean you started the whole thing how about flea like because th those two were like they push each other so much from small kid time, and neither one would have accomplished what they accomplished without the other one. Because him and Barney had a, as you know, really funny relationship. They loved each other more than anything, and when Barney died, it was like the gnarliest shit ever on Flea. But like when they were around each other, it was like friction, you know, at all times, you know what I mean? And, and it was nonstop heckle fest, especially from Flea. And Barney didn't, he was like, he would just laugh it off. He didn't give a fuck, you know what I mean? Which was ironic because anyone else, if Flea talked to him like that, they'd be brawling, you know what I mean? Like like him and Pete did in Puerto that year. God, your story is like, it's had so many rad, like, ups and downs and, and incredible chapters. Like, what's been the biggest lesson? There's a bunch of them. 
as far as good lessons would be like go after whatever it is that you really really fucking want in life you like go after it as hard as you can because that's you might only get one chance a and b why wouldn't you go after your dreams you know what i mean if you've dreamed big you can go big that's one the other one would be fucking don't fuck with drugs <laughs> Because it'll fucking take you down, you know what I mean? That's a big lesson that I had to learn. Always stay true to your fucking people and be there for them. <clears throat> you know what I mean? I don't know how to elaborate on that, but I have a really deep feeling for that, you know what I mean? <clears throat> 